and Michael Remus. What's going on, gang? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily as we count down to tomorrow's NHL trade deadline here on WST. A reminder right off the hop, and especially for those of you that often will listen on the podcast after the fact, uh, tomorrow's a big day. It is our third anniversary Uh, But our focus is going to be on the deadline, and that means we're going to get going early tomorrow, 11 a.m., live on YouTube with a four-plus-hour show taking us right through the 2 o'clock deadline. We'll get all of the the remaining trades trickling in after the buzzer goes, uh, and then we'll finish it up around 3 with uh, our usual Friday marble race. But uh, make sure to plan to join us early tomorrow tomorrow as uh, we expect there to be quite a bit of activity, although quite a bit of activity over the last few days. As I mentioned yesterday, when uh, Connor was in for Michael, uh, it it kind of felt like it was the deadline (laughs) yesterday on the program. Uh, There was lots going on. We're going to get to all of it. There's been a few more trades today. Nothing as significant as what we saw yesterday, and still a bunch of significant names out on the market And it has been quiet from the Winnipeg Jets, although we do have some reporting on what's going on behind the scenes with the Winnipeg Jets, which we'll get to in just a couple minutes. Of course, the Jets are out in Seattle getting ready for the rematch with the Kraken tomorrow night, 9.30 p.m. start Winnipeg time. And the team is on the ice as we speak. So we'll pay attention to uh, Ken Weeb's reporting, who is out in Seattle with the club. Scott Billick's going to join us a little later on. We'll talk both deadline and big picture for the Winnipeg Jets. And coming up in about half an hour or less, actually, Dave Pagnotta from the fourth period, who certainly has his ear to the ground on uh, everything happening around the league, will fill us in on what he's hearing as it pertains to the final buzzer tomorrow uh, when trades will no longer be available to the 32 NHL teams. Just before we bring in Michael Rebus and get going, a big thanks to the sponsors that make our show happen each and every day. Uh, The gang at Cool Bet Canada, Princess Auto, uh, Wallace and Wallace, Canadian Club, Little Brown Jug, the Winnipeg Jets, Royal Sports, Boston Pizza, F Apparel, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Canadian Club, Modern Man Barbershop, Manitoba Battery, and great to have Spicy and the gang from Consolidated Supply back on with us as we head into the spring. We will also check in with our pal John Waldman from the Sports Hall of Fame a little later on today as part of our Sport Manitoba Takes a Community to Play segment with the good folks at Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. All right, back from a one-day absence. Michael Remus rejoins us. Remo, you you missed sort of a wild day yesterday on the program. There, ha- Actually, of the entire run, some yes. real significant trades, including that really interesting one. To me, the most interesting one we've seen so far, the trade is one for one. Casey Middlestat for uh, for Bowen Byram yesterday. Yeah, you and I were on for the other famous one-for-one trade uh, Adam Larson for Taylor Hall. We were on for that day, and there was a P.K. Subban. Shea Weber was around the same time. So I had flashbacks to that, actually, when I saw people tweeting one for one. But I think Colorado had to be big winners yesterday. Um, you know, they've been searching for a second-line center since they lost Nazem Kadri in free agency. You know, they weren't able to fill it last year. They got Ryan Johansson this year, and it didn't work out, so they ship him off and get uh, Walker in as for a first-rounder. And then they have all these defensemen, you know, Byram Young, promising puck-moving defensemen. They already have a lot of those. And he was kind of stuck there in the third pair and trade him for a second-line center because we talked how, hey, there are just not a lot of second-line centers out there if you want to trade for a first. So Colorado kind of, you know, trading from within. So I really like that move, the moves for them. 
they were pretty scary. And and after the show, Vegas with the Noah Hannafin trade, of course, Vegas from nowhere. I think big winners at the deadline, Hus, with uh, getting Anthony Mantha and and Noah Hannafin. Like, how does Vegas keep doing this? And will Vegas look to add more? Are they in on Jake Gensel? Are they in on someone else? Um, I'm not sure, but they're defending Stanley Cup champs, and they have a very scary uh, group of defensemen now with Noah Hannafin. So uh, we're still a little more than 24 hours away from the deadline moves to be made. Jake Gensel, where is he going to go? That's the biggest name left, I think. And we're still waiting on the Jets. I'm seeing us in the chat since we, you know, the show's been posted. It's been upcoming for a while. The do something Chevy crowd is making some noise here <laughs> in the chat in the chat today. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I often, I mean, listen, if you look at the history of the Jets, they have, I think, taken advantage of uh, of the market and made some really good deals at a good value as we got closer to the deadline. Now, I mean, this team went way ahead of the queue and jumped on Sean Monaghan for the first round selection, which I think has complicated a little bit of some of the discussions of other players they might like to look because they've already spent that asset but listen, Monaghan has been a great, great addition so far to the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, eight goals in eight games at one point. I mean, the power play is completely turned around with him here. So, I mean, that has been a win. I guess the big question right now is how much more might Kevin Sheveldayoff do? And, and you know, it was something that I asked Marat yesterday. And by the way, if you missed our conversation with Marat, it was great. He uh, Pat Steinberg couldn't make it in. Marat came in a little bit early, and we hit a ton of trade topics as well as jet topics. So if you did miss that, get back to yesterday's episode and check it out. Um, but I did ask him, you know, how he would think that, you know, what we had just seen with the Walker deal and then the uh, Byron for Middlestat deal, particularly with the Colorado Avalanche, was playing inside the Jets' war room and just how interesting it would be. But I don't think that there is a lot of, like, we've never seen Shevel Dayoff quickly react um, based on something other teams do. I mean, I think they've got a pretty clear focus and plan of the guys that they've been looking at. And, um, you know, we'll execute that and we'll see whether they're able to make things happen. I mean, we can say that they reacted quickly earlier when Elias Lindholm, who certainly was a target for the Winnipeg Jets, went to the Vancouver Canucks and the Monaghan deal. Um, but right now, I mean, a lot of these other teams, I think there is something to be said, Reem, that there may be some more bargains or more value on the board tomorrow because of the significant trades that have already been made by a bunch of the teams that will be in the playoffs and their ability or, frankly, inability to add more players due to assets that have been traded already as well as cap uh, as cap situation. Yeah, as you go down you know, towards the deadline, teams start to get desperate. They want to make get the deal done. You don't want to be holding a pending UFA for nothing. So at that point, hey, you might as well just get what you can. So, you know, I'm going down, I don't know, like which is, which is your favorite trade bait, trade target, trade board list here? I'm on the, the daily face-off one. Uh, Jake Ensel's number one. He's available. Riley Smith. Still available, Tyler Toffoli, and if the Jets are looking to upgrade at wing, uh, those guys available, Pavel Buchnevich. It uh, seems like the Blues are looking to, quote, get creative. That's insider speak from Frank Cervelli to get that done. Max Patcher ready, but he'd be on the move. I think Carolina is a team. You know, maybe they want to get that scoring, uh, scoring well, winger. They've, they've traditionally done nothing at the deadline. Yeah. Like, their owner does not like rentals. He only wants to acquire players with term. Which is interesting. That's kind of been a common theme here in Winnipeg of the uh, the thought of the organization. Although if you look back at, you know, players like Kevin Hayes, um, the Jets have not been afraid of you know getting players who would be traditionally rentals, you know, at this point. Sometimes more often towards the periphery of the lineup and depth players. Um, but as we've seen before with a player like that, and frankly, the Stasny deal. I mean, there was no guarantee he was going to be coming back and, and didn't, although he ended up re-signing there afterwards. So there are still a few players. I mean, from my perspective, the guy that would be the best fit that I think the Winnipeg Jets could make a deal happen for is Tyler Toffoli of the uh, New Jersey Devils. Can play on the right wing, you know, is on, you know, another 30-goal pace, a guy that's been very, very, 
you know, productive in the playoffs. I mean, to shore up the top four. That like for me personally, that's a guy that I would love to see uh, come here to Winnipeg. But I think we're seeing right now with the amount that we've heard his name mentioned, um, there's not just the Winnipeg Jets that are in, in the mix. And for all the people that want this deal to be made now, I think many of the sellers are still playing the other teams that are in the mix right now and aren't ready or maybe don't feel that they've got final offers for all these teams. So uh, there is some patience that's needed, certainly for fans. But if there's one thing that the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets has shown he has in spades in the past, it is patience. Although something's got to happen before 2, two o'clock tomorrow. Yeah, and he's made trades before the deadline. I'm sure we'll have some. I remember you know, last year was Nemestikov on the deadline day. We were kind of underwhelmed at the time, but, I mean, he's been an incredible fit. He's played on every position. He's played on every line. He signed a contract. Uh, you know, he signed another contract over the summer, for, you know, this year and next year. So, you know, just going down the list, uh, Kyle Ocposo with Buffalo, Anthony Duclair with San Jose. I mean, these are teams that are way out of it that do you want to be holding, uh, you know, pending UFA. And who's the other one? Jordan Eberle was the one, too. There's some rumors he could re-sign with Seattle, but those are three, you know, UFAs, or do they go, you know... The Jets and Flyers have been rumored to be partners for a while, going back to the draft. They've been scouting each other. Scott Lawton, he's a player who's got two years remaining, $3 million AAV. But again, the Jets, you look at their contract situation, like Huss, they, they're pretty much set for next season. The only UFA on forward is Sean Monaghan. Perfetti's an RFA. Gustafson is an RFA. Everyone else is signed. So if you're going to be trading for someone who's got term, you're probably going to be trading someone out because I don't know how you fit all these guys. Uh, maybe if you want to go on, you know, defense, do they look at Jacob Chikrin? Uh, you know, he's a guy. He's got you know term, and you have Dylan, who's a UFA, and Demello, who's a UFA after this season. Um, I'm interested to see how this shakes out here with the Jets. I think they will do something, but how significant will it be? Will We'll have to wait and see, but other teams around them again. Um, Edmonton, they got Henrique yesterday, uh, Troy Stetcher today, and they got Carrick in oh, the Henrique trade. By the way, by but, the way, so I it, just did the lock shop with what's, Dusty. What's the response in Edmonton to these deals? <laughs> he, he goes, If you saw the text line today, you would have thought it was early November. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was going to put them as I was trying to think of like winners and losers, like. I don't want to say Edmonton's a loser, but I don't think the moves they made are as good as Colorado or Vegas for a team that wants to win the Stanley Cup this year. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, they had major, major cap issues that um, <laughs> I think Vegas has loosened it up a little bit with uh, IR. And by the way, when the Hannafin deal was made yesterday, yeah, and, <laughs> and uh, we looked and saw... They said, oh, well, uh, Vegas was uh, considering potentially putting Alec Martinez on LTIR. Yeah. Uh, the Somebody, and, you know, God bless the internet, took the infamous WWE scene of Steve, Stone Cold Steve Austin rolling in to the hospital to beat the hell out of Vince McMahon while yeah. he was in the hospital <laughs> bed and put Kelly McCrimmon's face on Stone Cold and Martinez's <laughs> face on Vince. <laughs> <laughs> getting closer to LTIR. I mean, a lot of this is about Mark Stone. And I know some people are like, oh, here goes Vegas. They're doing it again. I mean, listen, they might be out with their, out their captain for a long time. Jack Eichel's back in the lineup. He's obviously off LTIR. Uh, the guys they have on right now are Mark Stone and Robin Lehner. And Robin Lehner will not be returning. But from the report earlier from some sources that he had a lacerated spleen, I mean, that's a, six, that's a three to six month recovery. So if, if it is that, and I don't think it's been confirmed, but if it is that and it's three months, you're talking about well into the end of May. If Mark Stone shows up, gets out of the phone booth and puts the Superman costume on and is there in the first round of the playoffs, for sure there'll be a lot of people that'll be bent. Um, but it does seem right now that, um, you know, they're being very, very aggressive. And I think the Mantha edition, uh, you know, speaks to, the fact that they're trying to repeat as cup champs and the chances are they're not going to have their captain, Mark Stone, for a good period of time. Um, that Hannafin deal that came through, you got Miramanov, you got a first-round pick, and it just seems like, does it seem like maybe some of the sellers, 
like Ottawa in the Tarasenko deal in Calgary are being pushed around a little bit by some mm-hmm. of the top teams. Like, they, they didn't even get the 2025 pick. Uh, Kelly McCrimmon got a caveat that if they decide to trade that pick before tomorrow, that the Calgary pick will shift to 2026. Uh, maybe they wanted the 2026 pick. I, I I can't be sure, but it certainly did give Vegas even more flexibility, and I think that's why they're still rumored to be in the mix for Jake Gensel, who Kyle Dubas said he wanted to trade by last night. That has not happened yet, but we do expect him to be moved before the deadline tomorrow. Yeah, just on Vegas, I would give them credit. They make aggressive moves. Anyone could have had Jack Eichel last year, and it wasn't like they got him for free. They traded Alex Tuck, Krebs, a first and a second. And I know people want to say, oh. Well, that being said, it's easy to say anyone could have had him. Anyone, if but they wanted to, tr- if they wanted. I guess he did. I guess he did have his contract he, already. I mean, there he was, was no on the, move. He was on the trade block for so long, and no one wanted to pony up. Vegas did uh, give them. I think give them credit for that. And what they sign Max Pacioretty, or they traded for him, and then he didn't work out, and they got rid of him right away to Carolina for nothing. For and nothing. Remember, and at the time we're like, they just gave, they just gave him away. We can't believe that. And you know, he's torn his ankle like twice uh, since then, so it worked out. And as far as that, so I know I think they're aggressive, and we saw it worked out. We went over all their moves when they won the cup. So I give them, they've made a lot of smart moves. Maybe got lucky with the LTIR status. I'm I'm here for that. But as far as the trades, the Tarasenko trade, I saw the return. I was like, what, that's it? That's it, but then you remember, he had a no trade clause. He could say, you know, I'm not going to this team. I'm not going to that team. And so they only could deal with Florida. Maybe do they get bent over a little? I mean, I guess they could have held out. A lot. I guess they could have, I guess they could have held out and been like, but it seems, it does seem strange, you know, in hindsight now. Like, why would you sign or give a player who you're signing to one year a no trade clause? Were they that desperate to sign him? I mean, I guess they thought they were good. You know what? They probably thought they were going to be good, like everyone else. And they were like, "Yeah, we're not going to have to trade him at the deadline. That's we're going to be in the playoffs. Why would they? Why would we do that?" So, and I think we all Ottawa again, one of the more disappointing teams. And for Calgary, have you ever seen a trade like that where? They say, okay, we'll give you this pick, but if we trade the pick before, you're getting the later. I've never seen that. And, yeah, I'd, I think for a team that was going to trade, you know, get so many uh, picks, I don't know if Craig Conroy has done the best job in terms of getting a quality. He's got a lot of quantity, but in terms of quality, I'm not sure. But strange that <laughs> their pick can get – it can be the 2026 pick if they trade the 2025 pick before. That is – a strange condition. By the way, getting ready for tomorrow. Shout out to you. I see we've got the WST ticker yeah. is back with some of these, uh, some of these, uh, the uh, deals that have been made. Nice work, Reem. I got to update. I got to update it now. Uh, it'll be running during the thing. I got to put the Jets lines on there because Ken is in Seattle, as we know. Twenty minutes ago, jet skate underway. He says no Appleton, who he believes is under the weather. That flu has it's going around flu season. No, I've got it. Yeah, no, no Lowry, no Brossois. Uh, he's the oh, sorry, no Lowry. Brossois is the only goalie on the ice. Doesn't see Velarde, but we will get an update on his status by the end of practice, maybe in an hour. And here are the rushes: Connor, Shafley, Nemestnikov, Ehlers, Monahan, Iafalo, Need a rider, Perfetti, Baron, Gustafson, Kupari. And he just says, remember, forwards are missing as the flu bug is a factor. Morrissey, DeMello, Deal, and Pionk, Sandberg, Stanley, and Schmidt as the extra with Brossois on the ice. So that's our update. We'll wait and see. I'll have to update uh, the tickers. The moves are are coming in today, Hus, uh, 24 hours before the deadline. Well, exactly. We'll kind of pay attention to what Ken's got from uh, Seattle throughout the day. Uh, an update from Rick Bonus on uh, on all of those players. Um and yeah, you mentioned the flu. I don't know, like later, like just kind of towards the end of the show yesterday, I started to really feel it. And it got me very worried, Remus, about tomorrow's show. Not that the show will not go on, but it did remind me of the trade deadline in 2022 when I was in the midst of full-blown COVID and had my my flu game, if you will. <laughs> One of the most incredible moments of guts and fortitude in podcasting history here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, and I hope that won't be the case tomorrow. But uh, 
Um, we're, it, listen, we're going to be on. It's going to be great to have Connor with us as well. We'll have a bunch of the other guys uh, you know, drop in from the arena tomorrow and uh, have the latest from uh, all around the, uh, the National Hockey League. Um, let's take a quick look at what has happened today um, because there has been – um, oh, okay, time zones, just uh, mentioning, yeah, Scott Billick's going to probably uh, join us. And then what time is Dave going to pop so on? So I got to just follow up with Billick, see if he can come on early. Pagnotta is going to come on in the two in the two hours. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so we're going to wait a little bit for Dave Pagnotta due to uh, those pesky time zones. Uh, but we'll see if Billick can jump on sort of at the bottom of the hour mm -hmm. if he is uh, good to go. But here's what's happened today um, since last night. Um, the Minnesota Wild traded Brandon Duhame to the Colorado Avalanche. And, um, you know, I remember we were talking about Duhame, the guy with some grit to his game with Jesse Pierce when we were getting ready for the rematch between the Minnesota Wild and the Winnipeg Jets a few weeks ago. Um, the Wild get the Avalanche's third round pick in 2026 in exchange for Duhame. While we were doing the lock shop with Dusty, the Oilers made another uh, addition. Uh, depth defender Troy Stetcher coming over. He's got a $1.1 million salary. Oh, and they got a tw uh, seventh round pick from Boston in 2024 as well. Um, so Stetcher's now with the Oilers. The return to the Coyotes, a 2027 fourth round selection. Um, I guess kind of a minor league deal. Uh, Habs acquired Jacob Perot from the Ducks for Yan Misak. And then, <laughs> you know, the one the one player that was dealt that, you know, I know there were some people around the market that thought this guy would be a nice fit. Certainly no analytic darling, but um, as Jake said uh, in the on the show, you can't teach size. 6'5", Joel Edmondson. Um, he is uh, an 875,000 retained at 50% from the Capitals. So for Edmondson and the cap considerations, the Caps get the Leafs, uh, sorry, the Islanders third round pick this year and the Blackhawks fifth round pick next year. Um, you know, we, we knew that the Leafs were going to be trying to add some additional defense help. Uh, they got Labushkin last week. Now they get Joel Edmondson. So, um, I know there were some people that were hoping Skylar Peters one of them that uh, there might be a little homecoming for Edmondson, but uh, that will not be the case, and he has been acquired by the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. And then, of course, the big deal that was reported by Darren Drager that took a while to get done, and I still haven't heard if there's been an extension with Hannafin or not, but Noah Hannafin goes from Calgary to... This is very, very, okay, so they get Daniil Mir Miramatov, Calgary gets a first-round pick. This is the one we've talked about that it's for 2025, but if Vegas decides to trade that before the deadline, it'll be a 2026, and a, a third-round pick that if they win a playoff round becomes a second-rounder as well. So, I mean, I guess they got a first-rounder. That's what they wanted. Now, it might be well in the future. It was a little bit. Uh, it was a little bit underwhelming. Philadelphia acting as a broker in this deal. Uh, they get a fifth round pick from Vegas in this year's draft, and uh, Vegas ends up getting Noah Hannafin, and uh, I guess just some guy, uh, Mikhail Vorobyov, uh, because there it, there does need to be players going back and forth when teams are just eating twenty five percent. So, you know, I went through Frank's tweet about all the players that were coming in. Uh, to Calgary and the picks that were coming in for everyone that they traded since Toffoli went out last year. I have to say it's a little underwhelming. Like this has not been, and you feel for these, you know, these Canadian teams that are trading from a position of weakness. We talked about the Tarasenko deal. And I, listen, Ottawa signed that deal, so it's only on them, but a new management group without very much that they could make happen. And, uh, and now one of the top defenders on the market, Noah Hannafin, shows up in Vegas to help the uh, Knights try and, uh, first of all, turn their fortunes around recently. They got the Canucks tonight at home um, and then get into the playoffs and uh, make a big run like they did last year. Yeah, again, Vegas is D. I mean, they were a Stanley Cup uh, champion D last year, and 
I mean, you pull it up on, uh, you know, Daily Faceoff, great site for the lines, and you have Theodore, Petrangelo, uh, Hannafin now, Martinez, although he's on LTIR, uh, McNabb, Haig, Whitecloud, they got some big guys, solid defenders. Uh, if everyone's healthy, this is a very solid team, but I see everyone uh, pointing out in the chat. You look at Vegas in their last time, they have had a lot of injuries. Uh, Eichel's been out. Uh, Stone, we know, continues to be out. And you look at them in their last 10, Huss, they're on a three-game losing streak, Vegas. Two, seven, and one in their last in their last 10. But they're going to have a month and a bit here to figure out and pull themselves out of the spin because they're fourth right now in the Pacific, which is kind of crazy. Uh, behind Vancouver, behind Edmonton, behind L.A., and there's Vegas. And L.A.'s a team we haven't really heard a lot of, maybe because they, well, they traded some of their capital in the Dubois trade, but... Uh, we'll see if they're looking to do more uh, here as we go ahead. Yeah, L.A. did make a couple of minor moves trying to get guys off the books yesterday, uh, put a couple of players on waivers, uh, including Jared Anderson Dolan. Um, and I think people thought that that was a precursor to some sort of a move heading into the deadline. As of yet, we haven't heard from uh, the Los Angeles Kings. But listen, I mean, they fired Todd McClellan. Jim Hiller's been in there. They sort of have righted the ship, if you will, and... I'll say this about the Kings, and I know we inevitably get back to talking about Dubois and how underwhelming he's been considering what the package was that came to Winnipeg in the Dubois trade. Um, but they still have an incredible structure, a lot of really good players. If the goaltending can hold up, that's not going to be an easy team for any any team, whether it be in the Pacific Division or potentially a wildcard team to be playing in the first round. But... Um, Edmonton has made a couple of moves. Obviously, the first round pick for Adam Henrique was the uh, was the big one. Uh, they also got Sam Carrick, and then uh, earlier today they got Troy Stetcher. The Vancouver Canucks are really interesting to me, Reem, uh, especially considering they made the big move for Elias Lindholm, and then yesterday, later on in the day, Kevin Week saying he was hearing about a potential three way deal where Elias Lindholm and his stay in Vancouver would be short. He'd be on his way to Boston. Boston would send Jake DeBrus to the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Penguins would send Jake Gensel to the Vancouver Canucks. So uh, that was just something that Weeks had reported was being discussed. Um, but listen, some GMs are getting creative. I know Kelly McCrimmon's getting a lot of, a lot of love right now, and deservedly so, for what he's been able to do and how aggressive they've been. And so much of that comes down to Bill Foley. I mean, I think they legitimately do have the most aggressive owner in the league. And uh, there are some teams that wouldn't think of literally doing everything they can, future be damned. Um, but I think Vegas, if there's any team to do that, considering the success they have getting people in free agency, you know, the tax situation, I mean, they're they're in a, in a good spot. Um and they're certainly taking advantage of it right now. So uh, with the direction their team's been playing, they knew they had to get, would get aggressive. They've done that. And from the sounds of it, they are not done yet. All right, we're going to get Scott Billick on coming up in a, uh, just a couple of minutes. And then Dave Pagnotta a little later on. Right now, though, let's uh, thank our sponsors, including great to have Consolidated Supply back with us on board. Got a shout out Spicy and the guys over at Consolidated Supply. It is... Uh, I know we got a snowfall warning right now, and it doesn't really feel like spring. But I'll tell you what, we're into March, folks, and uh, this is going to come, and then it's going to go. And uh, we're going to be working ahead on uh, all sorts of projects, and uh, whether it is for your business or your home, our guys at Consolidated Supply are ready for a big spring and summer. They, of course, are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, Golf Carts is the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba, both new and used. They've also got other great options for your property, including amazing hot tubs and incredible outdoor kitchen options. And of course, they're also the experts and the go-to guys for small engine parts and repair. Check out Consolidated Supply online at cte.ca and head on down to their showroom, open to the public at 1395 Niaqua Road East. Tell them the boys at Winnipeg Sports Talk sent you. And again, their website for more on Consolidated Supply is cte.ca. Uh, uh, a big congrats to Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery. The new location's finally open. 
head on down and check them out at the new spot in the south side of the city, 452 Dover Court Drive, a, a beautiful new facility, a great home for the Manitoba Battery Gang. And, uh, you know, we've uh, they've got some, they always have great deals. I mean, the best prices in town, they beat the pants off the big box stores, period, shopping local. Uh, but they're in such a good mood with this new uh, new location that any battery you need that's regularly priced at over 60 bucks is now 10 bucks cheaper when you pick it up in store. And check this out. If you need double A's or triple A batteries, skip the cheap versions and grab some industrial grade energizers for only 40 cents a piece. Those deals and much more grand opening specials right now for Manitoba Battery. 452 Dover Court drives the new location, the original spot, 1026 Logan Avenue. And of course, you can always order online at manitobabattery.com or give them a call at 783-8787. Um, fellas, thinking about spring, if you need uh, a new look or uh, just want to refresh the cut, get on down to Modern Man Barber Shops with eight locations in the city of Winnipeg, including their newest standalone locations on Plessy Road and Pemina Highway right by Bishop Modern Man Guys has you covered with a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. We can book your look via modernmanbarber.com and then make sure to give them a follow on Instagram as well at Modern Man Barber Shops. And uh, just before we uh, continue the festivities here, uh, got to shout out our friends at Canadian Club, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey, at such a great event with uh, WS Tears and the Canadian Club Gang at the um, Whiskey Festival event we did at the um, uh, Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame that we uh, look forward to doing it again. But in the meantime, Whiskey Fest is over, but the great taste of Canadian clubs always waiting for you at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. Check out their display when you pop in next. And remember to always enjoy responsibly. All right, let's uh, let's get Billick in here. Scott Billick of the Winnipeg Sun firing it up for a, a big, big day tomorrow down at the rink and uh, Dave Pagnotta after 2 p.m. with what he's hearing on the deadline. Scotty, what's up? How are you? It's going, man. Just shoveling out, that's all. Just shoveling out. Yeah, we got a bit of a yeah. dump last night. Everyone's like, no, big... there's no way. Snow does not happen in Winnipeg anymore. <laughs> the, the storm shield failed last night. That's and, right, uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we that's got right. quit it. <laughs> <laughs> quite a bit of it um yeah let's uh listen we'll talk about the games coming up this weekend where the team is at but um wanted to first off get your thoughts on what we've seen in the trade market over the course of the past 24 36 hours or so including some loading up for the vegas golden knights yeah. and in particular in the central division some very interesting moves by colorado i love what Kelly McCrimmon does. And I know this, like, I know chat's probably going to blow up on these sorts of things because, you know, you, you could, I, I know some people view it as cheating, right? Um, at the end of the day, Kelly McCrimmon, and I would suggest, you know, Julian Breezebois is in this and he's done it in the past. These guys are, Julian Breezebois, the GM in Tampa Bay, for those who may not know. Um, what these guys do is, explore the outer reaches the the far reaches the uh, of of the cba and they find ways to make things happen and not only that they're creative right like i mean if you look at the noah hannafin deal it, it, vegas ends up getting him with 75 percent retention like that's to me that's brilliant right it's brilliant in a couple of ways one is brilliant because you have noah hannafin who's i, I believe making 1.237 million uh, against the cap right now for, for Vegas. Um, and so it, it allows them to keep being in these conversations, whether it's Butchnevich, whether it's Gensel, whether it's whoever, right? Like th that stuff's interesting to me. Um, so I, I just find, I find it, I find that stuff brilliant. I, I, I think fortune favors the brave in this situation, right? Like I think, I think some of the GMs who, who go out and really kind of, and, and you know, are there some shady things that happen? I mean, we don't. Are have you to suggesting that Mark Stone isn't hurt? I'm not saying that he's not hurt, but I'm saying that I'm saying that there are things that happen. Like we we saw it with Nikita Kucherov. We all know what happened there. Um, I mean, the fact that the guy wore a T-shirt 
I mean, that's got to be one of the more sought after T-shirts in NFL NHL history is getting that teacher saying they were however what 18 million over the cap I think is what the teacher said something like that like I mean that stuff's incredible um you know I I find it interesting but you can't get everybody I mean it's not like they have they've added fully I mean they they have Mantha and and Hannafin and those are good ads I mean uh, that's good for them they've made some good ads I th- I think I'll say this about Kevin Cheveldale I think the absolute silence that's coming out of that place right now is a good sign. Um, I, I do believe that. I think this team is is hard in the war room right now, trying to figure out what they can bring in. Um, are they willing to take a big like? This is the problem that they're going to have, right? Like, when, once you start waiting on these things, and they didn't wait with Sean Monahan, which I think was a big ad. But if you think, and I think right now they know they need a winger if they can find one. Um, I mean, there's some good names out there. There's Tyler Toffoli. There, there's 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 obviously Pavel Buchnevich. There's going to be that guy that Kevin Shevoldayev has his eye on that nobody has seen coming. Um, I wonder if they're if they're looking for that. I mean, we've seen today. Yesterday was sort of the big names, some of the big names at least going. Today is a little bit, little bit more nibbling around the edges. Um, but I'm I'm curious to see what happens. I think the one thing that you also have to consider with the Jets if they add somebody. Unless Gabe Velarde is going on IR retroactive, which I think that probably is the play right now, um, unless he's going to play tomorrow uh, in, in Seattle, um, you know I, you're going to have to put somebody on waivers too. Like that's the one thing this team is thing. And and the other thing too is like I think this team actually is sort of content, not content. Content's the wrong word. Um, confident in the roster that they have. Um, but at the same time, I think we we can all see that there are holes that this. Uh, I mean. A sixth or seventh defenseman. I think that that's sort of where it is. I think Logan Stanley. We can say what we want about Logan Stanley's play. I don't think that penalty the other night really did himself any favors. Um, he didn't seem to be too pleased with. No, that uh, that's exactly what game. I'm. That's what I'm saying, right? I mean, it doesn't. See, this is the thing. We might not view it as. I don't know. I mean, I still think at the end of the day that that's a that's a problem, right? If you're gonna say you're not putting Nikolai Ehlers out there because of giveaways. You got to think that Rick Bonus also thinks sort of the same way, at least in private, about taking a late penalty that leads to a game-winning goal again. So, like that, that's a tough one. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I do think I think I think that low-key Rick Bonus has been showing this team, uh, showing Kevin Day off over the last few weeks that they need a winger, right? I mean, they're trying to find, with, especially with Gabe Velarde out, they've put Nemestikov out there. Uh, Cole Perfetti is not a top-six winger on this team at the moment. And, you know, I think that's sort of exposed another hole that this team has. I don't think they would like Alex, Alex Ayafalo there permanently on the second line. Um, having another score opposite Nikolai Ehlers with, along with Sean Monaghan is, is probably what they're looking at. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's certainly an interesting time. But I would say that the, the silence from, from the Chevy Shovel Day Off camp right now, uh, that's when you know these guys are sort of like going – going at it and 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 maybe that means and often in the past it's mean okay well they're gonna be in on a guy that nobody knows or or they're just trying to put together a package for Buchnevich and that one's a tough one right because if they do that one and we all know what the asking price is not necessarily what the price is going to be but who are you willing to give up and who's untouchable is anybody untouchable I mean I think Rick McGordy is 100% untouchable I think also Elias Salmonson is also untouchable and the reason for that is I think this team views um, Josh Morrissey, or sorry, Ally Samuelson as Josh Morrissey's partner in a couple of years. Um, so I think that's there. And then I don't really think they want to part with Colby Barlow either. So now that leaves you with Brad Lambert, Billy, um, you know, and th- this is the other thing. Like those guys aren't getting those guys aren't getting you, Buchnevich. I put well, this to, so I put this to the, the problem, chat yesterday right? here, and I'll put yeah. this question to you. Yeah, if you're serious about Buchnevich potentially retaining salary yeah. with another year on his deal, would you be willing to trade Cole Perfetti as part of that package? I think you have to look at it. I mean, I'm curious to know, I would love to know exactly what the Jets think about Cole Perfetti. Um, you know, I, I think you can look at Seattle. Seattle's just in here. Matty Beniers is not having a great second season in the NHL, right? So um, we know the guy who took the call there last year is having a tough time um, in, in, in his second season, that happens, right? Sophomore slump is, 
is a is a phrase or because of you know it, it, it's true in time in in a lot of cases right um you know that being said i i just wonder if he's not he the problem is he just doesn't really fit where this team is right now and and then and that might be the consideration right now that of if you would throw him into a deal Right now, I, I'm not entirely sure he's fast enough for that second line. Does that mean he can't get faster? No, I, I think he can. Um, but I also think, and I wrote about this a couple weeks ago, like I think that you could look at Cole Perfetti as part of the Mark Shifley plan too, right? Like it, it takes some time, but eventually these guys blossom into something that's really good. And I think they have this sort of uh, blueprint of what it can look like. Now, the difference between Shifley and and Freddie is the size, uh, one of them. And, and Shifley was allowed to sort of marinate in the, in the OHL for a couple extra years as well, where that wasn't really afforded to Cole Perfetti. I, I just, I can't imagine they're really, they're ready yet to cut bait on Cole Perfetti. But that, that being said, if your it, job is to try and win a Stanley Cup right now, and you've sort of promised this to, essentially promised this to Cole, uh, you know, Connor Helbeck and Mark Shifley w- upon re-signing here, that this is the road that you're going, I think you have to consider almost everything on this team. And here's the other thing too. If, if it's going to be a guy like Perfetti, well, then you're probably confident in a, in a guy like Rutger McGordy or Colby Barlow or, or even Brad Lambert, one of those guys that they can confidently come in next season and potentially play a top six role on this team. And so I think that's another interesting thing. Like, I think that would tell you, sort of kind of on the back end, if, if they were to trade Cole Perfetti, where they feel a guy like, I, I, I imagine, you know, at this point, it, it's Rutger McGordy that's sort of leading that leading that charge. We'll see if they would put him in the AHL for a year, um, assuming he signs out of college this year. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting thing. And, and to me, if you're trying to win a Stanley Cup, Huss, I don't know how much stuff can be off the table. And the, the only problem that we've always... And again, I think this is the, the one thing that we've maybe never seen with Kevin Shovel Day off is that real kind of commitment to like, I got to part with some of my children to kind of make this happen. Like we haven't really, really seen that. And and that's, I think, the big test here. Like can, can Kevin Shovel Day off kind of see the forest through the trees here to make that big move or at least try and take that big swing to land a guy. And Bucinavich is an interesting one too. Let's not forget this guy's got another year. So this is sort of a two year plan with Bucinavich this year and next year. Um, and if you land a guy like Bucinavich, where's Cole Perfetti playing anyways? And that's the other question that you have given this roster composition right now. I don't actually know where Cole Perfetti fits. So that might make it more palatable, let's say, to potentially trade a guy like Colbert. Yeah, like listen, I got I want this to be to be clear. Like I'm not sitting here stumping that um, you know, he's the guy they got to get out of town. Yeah. But if you want a player like Buchnevich and you've already traded your first round pick this year, yeah. you have to be and I mean for St. Louis, who's in a bit of a rebuilding phase and we've already heard that they're not particularly sold on Jordan Cairo, who's got his extension, I believe kicking in next year if i'm not mistaken or some sort of yeah. a no move or no trade and yeah. he's already been talked about potentially not being there long term you know they would be looking for a player like that and to cole's defense i mean he was very productive earlier this season yeah he's got 14 goals and over 30 points and like i'm looking at i'm looking at casey middlestat casey middlestat who was just traded yesterday for yeah, for bowen byron yeah. he was an eighth overall pick in the draft in 2017. So right in that zone where Perfetti was yeah. selected. Um, you know, it basically took him until last year to really pop at the NHL level. I mean, he came out as a rookie and played 77 games. Cole's outscored him. Uh, that he had 12 and 13. Perfetti's numbers are past him in both. And then next year, he struggled and spent half the year in Rochester. Yeah. And then came back and played 41 games, 40. And it wasn't until last year he had a 59-point season in 82 games. Again, on a bad team. Yeah. Uh, and then this year, he's actually leading them in scoring. I mean, Tage Thompson's been injured and hasn't been as productive. Yeah. Um, but then he gets moved for for Byron. We can kind of get into that. That's we'll ask Dave trade about that too, trade. Right? Yeah. Well, especially when you when he basically – when you look at the Sabres' depth chart on the blue oh, line no. – 
He's their third left shot defenseman. I well, mean, behind just, Owen Power and yeah. Rasmus Dahlin. So yeah. you naturally think of whether there's more to go. But back to Perfetti. Yeah. Like, guys, if you want to get at Birchnevich, and again, Birchnevich is so attractive because it's not a rental. You'd have him for two years. You're essentially making that swing to try to give yourself a great chance to win this year. And in the first year of the extensions of Shifley and with uh, Connor Hellebuck, you know, you've got that player as well, and who knows what's available beyond. So uh, if you're considering, if you're expecting, hey, they need to go and do that, like they're not trading him for Logan Stanley and for Vili Hainala and Montreal's second-round pick, yeah. I guess is my point. So if you do yeah. believe that, hey, this is the team that can win this year, like Bushnevich in particular because of that second year, I think the price for Toffoli is less. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big, like, that's a guy they're definitely going to be talking about and going to be in on. And then maybe there's some players that, like, I think about Jason Zucker in Arizona, who I think probably comes a tier below when it comes to the cost there. There yeah. are some other guys that are out there, but I mean, I think Butchnevich and Toffoli would be the most impactful guys that could fit in that spot. Yeah. And Toffoli in particular, being a right winger, you it, it doesn't kind of fall into next year because he will be a UFA and the cost might be a little less. Um, but back to your point about where Cole is right now and what they think about him long term, I mean, I think they think the guy can be a productive top six player. Well, yeah. How soon that will come and will he even be a part of a team that's battling these big teams in the playoffs, I think is a major question mark in the here and now. Well, here's a question for you too, Huss. Like, so you 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 mentioned Jordan Cairo earlier. Do you think the Jets might be interested in looking at that as a long term project? Jordan Cairo is just entering the prime of his career. He's 25 years old. He's a 30 goal scorer in the NHL. He's a right wing, right? Like, if you're if you're the Blues, like, and I'm not saying this is happening. I'm I'm purely speculating yeah. here. But maybe we're looking at the wrong guy. Maybe Buchnevich is like the 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 one that makes the most sense now. But if you're thinking about moving a guy like Cole Perfetti, would you not be maybe looking maybe longer term at a guy like a Jordan Cairo? Now, the one interesting thing about Jordan Cairo, that, and it's going to make it very difficult to fit, is his extension, as you said. It's an $8.125 million um, cap hit. Uh, and uh, you're right. I mean, he has eight more years, well, seven more years, I guess, uh, left after it. Uh, no trade protection starting in 25, 26. I'm not saying that this is happening by any means, but I wonder if you're the Jets and you're thinking about, okay, well, what makes sense long-term here? Does Jordan Cairo make the most sense, more sense than Pavel Buchnevich, right? I mean, that's an interesting thing. I think Especially Bonus consider- would absolutely <laughs> hate Jordan Cairo, to be honest with you. You're right? probably I think he's right. just yeah. an absolutely one-dimensional player. Yeah, but that, he scores. I mean, that, yeah, Well, he I scores, agree. and yeah. there's something to be said for that. I mean, listen, yeah. that reminds me of a couple other guys on this team, to be yeah, honest with you, that play a lot and that do quite well. But, you <laughs> yeah. know, his his lack of buy-in under Barubi, I think, was a huge part of why Barubi got fired. And yeah. then we all remember what happened after that. So... Yeah. To me, if the Jets are trying to build this team in the mold of what they've been certainly earlier on the season they're trying to get back to right now, like yeah. is he a talented guy that can put up points? Absolutely. I just don't know that they would be willing because I mean again, yeah. you're if there's yeah. no wait and see with Jordan Cairo. You acquire him and he's on the books for yeah. a significant amount of time at a very significant amount of money. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I just it's an interesting thing to kind of wonder what the Jets consider because it, it, I mean, because at the end of the day, you're asking the Jets to basically probably part with two, maybe three sort of first rounders to get a guy like Boots Neighbors. Like if you think about Perfetti, and then you think about they probably want another guy on top of that, a prospect who's probably going to be a first rounder as well. And then who knows what the pick is? I mean, you might get away with the second round pick, the Montreal one. Um, just because it's going to be so low, but I don't know. Like, who knows? Like, you know, it's... I I wonder about this. And again, this also comes to the value of a Perfetti. And listen, right. I think different teams will value the player differently. But I mean, he's a top ten pick. He is, you know, in his first real full year in the National Hockey League. Has listen, the guy's totally hit the wall, and he's out of the top six right now. Yeah. But by the numbers, has shown that you know he can be productive playing with good players and. I think any team that would get him would do that. But like, would yeah. you rather have Perfetti 
or a first round pick of a team that, you know, likely will be contending for a cup. Exactly. I mean, like yeah. those 28th picks overall are as much as lottery tickets. And I think in this right. year's draft, there's not a lot of difference between a first rounder of a team that goes three, two rounds yeah. in the playoffs to the Montreal pick as well. Yeah. So like, is the value of Perfetti more than one of those quote, second half of the draft first rounders? And you know, what does that mean? If you include the, is the pick, I mean, I, I'm just thinking, and who knows St. Louis might say that this is not really the style of guy that we're looking for and we're not into, but if you don't want to trade Rucker McCordy and Elias Salmson is going to be on your blue line next year. Yeah. And by the way, speaking of Brad Lambert, uh, Lambo, yeah. well, he had a hell of a game last night in Milwaukee yeah. for the, uh, for the moose shout out Jeff Malad. Our guy had a uh, hat trick last night. Um, I mean, those are all players that, you know, especially with the extensions coming in and with some of your top players making more money, having those guys on ELCs is incredibly important. And, yes. uh, you know, you wonder where they think of their window is. I mean, like, to me, this is not a this year or bust thing, but I think yeah. and that's why Butchnevich is so interesting is that, yeah, it'll cost you more than probably most of the other guys on the market, but you're really putting yourself in a position to take a big swing and have a best chance to win over not just one but two seasons. Exactly, and I think that's it, right? Like, can you, can you get to a point in your head, not your head, but, like, just, like, maybe even the fan base's collective head – where you look at the spending of Buchnevich now as a two-year spend that's spread across two years, right? Like, I think that's sort of how you have to look at it because essentially what you're going to do is Buchnevich next year would essentially be a, a self-rental, right? Because this team would keep him, assuming that they're doing right now. Here's the flip side of Buchnevich, too. If the, if the Jets somehow aren't a good team next year and they go into the trade deadline for whatever reason – you, you're going to be able to flip a guy like Butchnevich back to recoup some of your things. I wrote about this yesterday. Like, I, I think I, I think the the risk isn't as high as people necessarily would look at it because if the Jets don't do well next season, there is a chance to get a good chunk of what you spent back, right? I mean, it's not going to be the same players or whatever, um, but there is that opportunity to do that. So, But I, I agree. I mean, I think you have to look at Butchnevich as a, a two-year shot that really, really opens the window back up. Um, and, and, you know, you figure out what's going to go on this summer. But if you look at it, by the time that's ending, and if you look at the Jets uh, cap friendly, I mean, you know, some of the guys that are, are up after next year, the, the, the Iafalos, the Ehlers, uh, Appleton, Nemestikov are all up. Uh, you know, I think uh, Neil Pionk and Nate Schmidt are up. You know, so looking at those guys who are up at the end of not this season but next season, the, the roster composition is likely going to change quite a bit um, as well at the end of that. I mean, I can see Ehlers and IFL are probably getting re-signed, but who knows? Like, we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so Buchnevich, I mean, if you look at it right now, he gives you the best two-year sort of two chance, two kicks at the can um, at, the, at a Stanley Cup. Um, and it, again, this is why a lot of people have pegged him as maybe the, at the top of the wish list because he just offers that extra one year of term. And the fact that, you know, the, the blues came out yesterday and said that the salary retention's there, um, that that's music to, to Kevin shovel Dayoff's years because the problem before that was they would probably have to move somebody out. Like it's just not possible to fit that given some of the bonus. I think the jets are going to have about 5.8 million of deadline space um, to work with, but you also have to factor in like performance bonuses and all that sort of thing. Um, it's unless the Jets want to take an overage charge on the bonuses next year, which they won't want to do. Um, you know, they're going to, they'd have to move something out or, you know, uh, likely would they'd have to get some retention. Now it doesn't sound like you need, and potentially here too, there is a chance here that the Jets could try and find a, a, a 25% um, party here too, to get that, that number down to basically what Noah Hannafin's making in Ve or which is accounting against the cap in Vegas. So that's an interesting thing too. That if the Jets can get really creative with, the salary cap tension here, you could potentially add Buchnevich and then, you know, find a, you know, kind of like an Alexander Carrier or somebody like that um, on, as a right shot defenseman that would also help this club and be able to do both things. So I, I think Buchnevich is, you know, probably priority number one for this team, unless, you know, as we've seen before in the past, Kevin Shovelayoff is looking for something, you know, that find, trying to find that Paul Stasny that nobody sees coming.
Yeah, the uh, yeah, well, the next twenty four hours is going to be uh, is going to be yeah. really interesting and uh, and a lot of fun. Um, you're going to be down at the rink tomorrow. Um, how is this all going to work? I mean, Chevy did not go with the club. They didn't right. set up a war room in Seattle. Yeah. So uh, I would assume that he, Larry Simmons, his assistants will uh, all be huddled somewhere in the yeah. whereabouts of uh, Canada Life Center and then uh, speaking at some point later on in the day once um, it's clear one way or the other as to yeah. uh, what has been uh, given up and what's coming in. Yeah, a fairly standard day actually down there other than the fact that the Jets are playing that night away. It just happened in the past, but um, yeah, Kevin Shoveldaff will stay there. They're probably, I'm guessing they'll set up in the middle of the Jets dressing room like they have before and, and just kind of go to war uh, and try and figure it out, right? But uh, yeah, it should be interesting. It's always interesting down there. Like, I mean, we see all these trades going. Everybody says, oh, hey, you know, what are they going to talk about tomorrow? And But, you know, there, there's always players, right? We'll see what the rest of the day brings. It's only 2 o'clock in the afternoon Central Time right now. There's lots of time um, for some of these big names to go. But it could be a pretty big day for the Jets tomorrow. There's also been some talk that the Jets aren't really, you know, I guess looking to make a huge swing too. I don't know how much of that is actually true. It's not exactly what I've heard. I mean, you know, when you when you think about, when you hear that the Jets want, uh, they, 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 they want a winger and a defenseman, um, you know, that that's not, a, that's not a slow day for this team. Let's just say that. So, um, yeah, but it should be an interesting day down there. Um, always fun. Uh, lots of people there. Uh, everybody brings snacks, and uh, they're gonna have breakfast and lunch for us. Tomorrow. Yeah, we'll bring your That's computer. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna be doing. Uh, we're gonna be oh, cranking yeah, out be an fun. extra four hours. So uh, if you have some time at some yeah. point, you know, Mike's gonna jump on. Jeff's gonna come on. Big day too. Uh, third birthday of WST. We're gonna be sort of preoccupied. However, we do have some party favors for when things get a little slow. Uh, we picked up a hobby box of the new upper deck, so we'll crack a few packs as oh, there well. We go. For, uh, packs if we're, if we're waiting, if oh, we're yeah. waiting for it, um, <laughs> uh, it, it should be uh, it should be a fun day for sure. And as I say, we're getting yeah. going at 11 a.m. tomorrow live on YouTube. So uh, even if you're a regular podcast listener, try and uh, make a point of jumping on the YouTube channel, hit us with a sub, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to uh, cranking it out uh, at least for four hours and. I guess uh, kind of play it by ear as we uh, get through past 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and uh, when Kevin Shovel Day Off speaks. Scott, always great having you on the program. Uh, let's uh, make a plan to uh, connect tomorrow as we yep. uh, hear the latest around the league and with the Winnipeg Jets. Appreciate it. Yep, sounds good, guys. Appreciate it. See you tomorrow. Good stuff. All right. Uh, let's uh, – well, we're going to have Dave Pagnotta join us in just a few minutes. Uh, it's been a little bit quiet over the last few – well, last hour or so. Uh, but there's still some smaller deals made, but looking forward to picking Dave's brain on uh, what he's hearing regarding the Jets as well as uh, uh, the other bigger names that seem to be uh, up high on uh, everybody's trade bait boards. Uh, before that, though, let's thank our sponsors and, of course, our friends at Little Brown Jug. You train day in and day out, learning new techniques, approaching new concepts, and living out the thrill of achieving your goals. Building a craft beer is no different. While you spend your hours on the ice, we spend ours here. Brewing our trademark beer. Again, again, and again. Here's to pushing the status quo and challenging ourselves to build something memorable. 1919 by Little Brown Jug. Big thanks to Little Brown Jug. We'll probably be cracking a few generics after that extended show on Friday. Planning to get going at 11 a.m. on trade deadline day, which also happens to be the third anniversary of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Also want to thank Wallace and Wallace. They are gearing up for a big spring. <clears throat> it's going to be uh, very shortly. Hopefully the snow will leave and we'll be seeing the Wallace and Wallace fences and trucks all over the city. They're the fencing and overhead door experts in the city since 1946. And while fencing will be everywhere come uh, the uh, melting of the snow, Right now, with these crazy fluctuations in temperatures, is the time that's putting the most stress on your garage door. Now, if you need a new garage door, they've got the best selection in town as the Clope dealer in Manitoba. Uh, but to prevent downtime for your garage door, you can give Wallace & Wallace a call to book your maintenance and inspection service call today uh, for commercial and residential overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know. And that is Wallace and Wallace. Um, speaking of looking good, you got to shout out our pals over at F Apparel. 
uh, when the snow melts. You know what comes up next. Wedding season, people getting out. A real uh, time to uh, maybe spice up that wardrobe, fellas. And if you do need to do that, get down to Winnipeg's number one menswear plot spot, and that is F Apparel. They have uh, incredible deals on custom suits beginning at just 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of uh, menswear accessories. If you are getting married or in a wedding party, definitely talk to the fellas at F about a 15% discount when all the guys get their suits at F Apparel for the big day. Uh, they've also got great deals for high school grads. If you're looking to get that young man a suit that he can wear far beyond his big day, moving out of the uh, of the school age years. Um, F Apparel, find out more online, book an appointment. It's fephapparel.com and pop down and see him at 190 Smith Street. And just before we bring Marat back in, I got to shout out our friends at Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. Speaking of spring and summer, cannot wait for the upcoming fishing season. If you're looking for a world-class fly-in fishing opportunity right here in Manitoba where you can be on the water in less than two hours, Aikens Lake is the spot. As incredible as the world-class fishing is, even a guy like me caught a couple master anglers there. Uh, it's the hospitality of the Aikens team and the Turin family that puts the experience way over the top. Find out more at AikensLake.com, and uh, you can also check them out on all their socials over at Aikens Lake. All right, Dave Pagnotta coming up uh, hopefully in just a few minutes. I see a uh, <laughs> T-Cone and Polly getting in on the super chat. Thanks, T-Cone. appreciate you. Shout out Jeff VL, big fight and game winner in the last 10 much more suited for fourth line than Perfetti. Move Perfetti for Buchnevich. Call up VL. Get good Branson. And he's always into the uh, into the grit, uh, and help out Lowry. And we contend. Um, hey, we're here for for everyone's opinions on this, and uh, keep them coming in uh, in in the chat right now. And if you're checking out the program afterwards, you can always uh, leave a comment. Uh, we often get to those. And actually, Remus, uh, lots of comments about the show in the last couple of days, obviously with so many topics that we're hitting uh, right now. Um, Reem, did you say that there was just a, a, a little bit of a more minor deal that just broke? Yeah, it just came through. The Avs and the Predators connecting on a trade. Uh, Frank Cervalli saying the Avs acquire Yakov Trenin from the Preds. They get Yakov Trenin, Graham Sward, and then the Preds get Jeremy Hansel on a 2025 Third round pick. That's Frank Saravalli reporting that one. So we got a, a minor. I'll have to update the ticker at the bottom. But yeah, we got a minor deal coming in. There it is. So a Trenin from the Preds to the Avalanche. And uh, Avalanche have been maybe the most interesting team with the deals that they've made. And we're going to uh, chop that up with uh, Dave Pagnotta, who's been very, very busy with the fourth period, fellas. Keeping their ear to the ground on everything around the uh, around the National Hockey League. Dave, what's uh, what's going on? How are you? Thanks for joining us. In Colorado, holy cow! Like they're it's not just it's not just the surplus of it's the quality of moves that they're making for for the ABS and for this group. I, I mean, you know, after after they added um, uh, uh, Duhame, excuse me, from Minnesota. Uh, they were looking around at other guys to kind of really solidify their bottom six. And you bring in Trennan, who's a, who's a physical body. He's, he's not afraid to get dirty um, to really stabilize that bottom six that they've got, probably fourth line duties, uh, but interchangeable third and fourth units. This is, this is a, a lot of shrewd moves by Chris McFarlane and Joe Sackick and, and the rest of the crew in, in Denver. I mean, this team, uh, you know, I, I thought – I, I don't know. This is it's. I don't even know how to describe it. I'm I'm just impressed by the quality of the ads that they've made. Well, well, and let's talk about the two big ones they made yesterday. I mean, uh, right. they move out Johansson, they get Walker, they give up a first round pick, um, and then they make a subsequent move trading. I mean, Bo and Byram, a cup winning young defenseman, fourth overall pick in the league, straight up hockey trade, one for one for Casey Middlestat. To me, that's been the most interesting trade so far this year um and i does make me wonder what kevin adams might be up to both in the next 24 hours but as well in the summer as they try to remake their roster um what was your reaction to that and what are you hearing about what uh, buffalo's doing um while trading middlestat and getting byram 
their third stud left-hand defenseman behind Owen Power and Rasmus Dahlin, back-to-back number one picks. Yeah, and, and sorry, I just keep checking. There's a lot. There's a lot going on here. A lot of lot of movement um, as as well. San Jose's got something on the burner. Anyway, uh, we'll try to figure that out. Um, look, so Buffalo with Middlestat, their their big thing. The word was that he's he's an RFA at the end of the season, and he's got Arbrights. And they were really concerned about the type of money he'd be looking for after having a bit of an explosive season. And having some uh, two solid back-to-back years, he's leading the team in scoring primarily because there's injuries to other guys, or there were. Um, but there was concern over what type of contract he would be looking for. And usually when that comes out, that means they've already talked about a contract and what that would look like. So clearly, Kevin Adams and his staff were a little bit concerned and worried about what they could potentially um, be able to sign him at. So... You move him. They wanted a hockey trade. They got a hockey trade. You bring in Byram, who's excited to be there. One of his best buddies is, is Dylan Cousins. He's got a couple other uh, friends on the team. Um, this is this is something. This is something that. Sorry, it looks like okay. San Jose is working on something. I don't know if it'll be happening just yet, but they, they got something going on here. Um, so I, I like. You're bringing in a, a guy who's probably going to get a little bit more minutes now. You stack up your decor, and you get a guy who's happy to be there. Not that he wasn't happy in Denver. He liked it there. But if he was going to go anywhere, like he's genuinely interested in being part of the Buffalo Sabres in that group because of the people that they've got around him. So I think it was a, a solid move for Buffalo, all things considered. And you look at the Avalanche, who have been missing a legit 2C since Nas Kadri went to Calgary. Um I think they found their guy in, in Middlestat, who's a little bit obviously smaller, but uh, can keep up with the pace of play that the Avs play at. Um, and between that move and bringing in Walker on the back end, who if you look at his underlining numbers and his, his analytics, they're ridiculous this season. Like really, really good two-way numbers. Puck control, puck battles, outs. Like he's, he's at the top in terms of, of D-men. So they've, they did that yesterday. They shore up their, their bottom six today. And if I'm the Jets and the Stars, I'm not too thrilled about those moves. <laughs> Dave Pednato of the fourth period with us. Um, you know, we may as well get right to this. I mean, we could talk about some of the other trades and what some of the other teams are hearing. Uh, the Jets are notoriously tight-lipped, and there has not been a lot leaking out of the building downtown. But um, what are you hearing about the Jets? Who do you feel that they are – interested in right now and uh, if you had to look and uh, put a marker down on uh, what we might see here in Winnipeg tomorrow how do you think that plays out well they they really you know they made their big move or or a significant move with the addition of of Monaghan and they did that piece of business over a month ago so it allows him to kind of get acclimated and, and more acclimated to their surroundings um to his surroundings and to the rest of the group they still have cap space. They've got over $5 million in cap space to play with. I don't know necessarily if they're going to be overly active in terms of, you know, the top tier guys on the market, but if they could look to bring in somebody else in a mid six role, maybe depth type of role up front and a depth defenseman, I think that's what they want to do. They don't they like Chevy can spend that full 5 million. Um, and he's got the blessing. He's got the, the okay to do it. But I, he's just not the kind that's going to just spend for the sake of spending, dollar-wise or asset-wise. I think he really likes his group. Um, and, if they again, if they can add some depth and quality depth, like guys that could come into the back end and he's interchangeable with one of their other defensemen or somebody that can further deepen their, their mid to bottom six, maybe if he's a little higher, you push somebody down the lineup. I think that's what they'd like to do. After the addition of – of, of Monaghan, I, I think they really like the overall makeup of their group. It's just a matter now of um, what, what they want, what they wanted to, to do, <laughs> to do uh, here. Sorry, just the Vegas Golden Knights were trolling everybody uh, just, just now on Twitter. They put the little eyes emojis and then their breaking news was that they've sold out an event that they've got coming up. So yeah, well, everybody Vegas was kind of working, wondering what the hell was going on. Well, Vegas is in, in all the fans heads. I can tell you that much. I don't yeah. know how much the rest of the uh, rest of the national well, hockey league. Look, listen, it, 
this is this is how crazy it is. I got a text from one of their one of their players while we're on here, just going, "What's going on?" <laughs> and I know he's checking Twitter every five seconds he can. So I, I haven't responded, but I'm sure he'll yeah. figure out that it's nothing. Yeah. Well, considering how aggressive <laughs> Kelly McCrimmon is and has been in the past in that organization, I'm sure nobody feels safe in that locker room. Uh, until uh, until the final buzzer is through. Just back to the Jets for a minute. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with Gabriel Velarde being out for a little bit and a little bit of uncertainty. I don't believe he was practicing today. He's basically no. missed the past week or so. Um, there has been thoughts that the Jets would still be looking for a winger that could come in potentially into the top six. Yeah. The people that we've been talking about, Tyler Toffoli is a guy that would be a great fit. And of course, Buchnevich in St. Louis, who's a little different. I think the ask is bigger because yeah. you're not just getting him for this year, but you're also getting him for next. Um, maybe start with Defoli. I mean, what is New Jersey? What's it going to take to get that deal done um, from a Jersey perspective? And then we can talk about what you're hearing about Buchnevich and the cost for St. Louis. Andy Strickland came on last week and said they don't need to trade him now, and they'd be looking yeah. for probably two first rounders or equivalent value if they were going to yep. make the move with Buchnevich. And a third asset. So you're looking at a, you know, basically the asking price for Bushnevich, I'll start there, is the first, excuse me, is the, is the same as, as Jake Gensel right now. The difference is Bushnevich has one more year on his, on his deal. But it's a first round pick, either another first or a top level prospect who's either about to jump into the NHL or, or has already dipped his toe in it. Basically someone ready to jump in. And a third piece, depending on who that player is and where that other first round pick could potentially lie. Um, in, in, you know, is it, is it a, towards the bottom? Is it a mid twenties pick? Like, like teams evaluate that as well. Um, but that's the price for Bushnevich. It's the same price for Gensel in Pittsburgh. So whether he ends up in Vegas or the Rangers or somewhere, that's the, that's the scope of what that, that is going to cost. Um, for Toffoli, it's effectively a first and a prospect, maybe not an A, maybe a B plus, but that's, that's what they're looking for right now out of out of jersey um they tried to get him signed they couldn't figure out term and money um and they're gonna they're either gonna leave it or they're gonna move him ahead of the deadline he likes it there but i wouldn't be surprised if he ends up you know being moved ahead of the deadline and the 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 team that is sneaky and really wants to get him but they need a third team in the mix is la they would love to bring tyler to foley back to la um i I think they understand what the cost will be to get him out of Jersey. I think they're prepared to do it, but they need a third team because New Jersey is going to have to eat half of that salary. It's not big money. It's four, four and a quarter. But if LA can get him at 25 cents on the dollar by having New Jersey and another team eat total of 75%, uh, they, they would love to be able to pull that off. Rob Blake is cooking right now. He's trying to see if he can, can make that happen. Um, and, and that just, as that's happening, other teams that have interest, like, the, like perhaps the Jets and, and Vancouver's in back in on him, the Rangers, other teams are looking at him, Carolina, they're all taking that into account and going, all right, we need to, we need to try to make something work here and maybe get ahead of, ahead of things before this spirals and we, we lose them somewhere else. But a lot of moving parts right now. Where, uh, where are things at with Jake Gensel from what you're hearing? And um, you kind of alluded to it, but um, I mean, what Kyle, what's going to make Kyle Dubas pull the trigger and actually do that trade, a trade where he said he wanted to have completed by last night? Yeah, well, um, well, clearly he didn't. Um, and there's a lot of different – there are a lot of pieces here that are um, – Excuse me one second. Let me just make sure that that's good. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces here with respect to that because they went out on Tuesday and, and, and Tuesday evening and told teams, give us your best offers. And that's taking some teams out of the mix. And then that's now created a bit of a war here because some teams are going, well, hold on. Like, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's not rush into anything just yet. The Rangers are in the thick of things there. Vegas is in the thick of things as well. Um, Florida's been kind of lurking. Edmonton was. I don't think they're, they're there right now. Um, uh, 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 blank. Oh, Carolina. So Carolina, every, a lot of people think that the Hurricanes are, are, are front runners. They don't spend big assets on rentals, and they, they just don't. That's not their MO. So to give up a first <coughs> – excuse me. Ooh, a first, a top prospect, and an additional asset – for Jake Gensel, who 
by all accounts, unless he's pulled a 180 on the Penguins and everybody else, wants to test the market as a free agent this July. I would be shocked if Carolina actually does it because, again, it's just not what they do. It's not Tom Dundon's philosophy, Donnie Waddell and Eric Tulski in management. That's just not what they do. So it's a 180 on their part if they end up pulling this off. So I'm a little skeptical about Carolina's interest on uh, on Jake Gensel. So we'll see kind of uh, how that unfolds. But I think the Rangers are right there. I think Vegas is right there. I think Vancouver took a step back a little bit. Same with the Panthers. Edmonton's probably not in that in that mix unless they can make the cap work. And the other thing, too, with respect to the cap, he's got a $6 million hit. Pittsburgh's probably going to have to retain. They have two retention slots left. They probably will have to eat 50% of that contract if it's a team like Vegas, for example, or the Rangers. Uh, Dave Pagnotta, the fourth period with us as we look ahead to tomorrow's NHL trade deadline. Um, Dave, tonight, Vegas is at home to the Vancouver Canucks. Um, you know, we're sort of particularly interested in just what's happening in and around the West. Vegas has made a couple significant moves already. Vancouver got out early with the Lindholm trade. Uh, what are you hearing about both of those teams, and um, how much more might those two GMs have cooking before uh, the gun goes tomorrow? Um, I apologize. I, I missed the, the, the two teams. Just the, the San Jose stuff may happen Vegas, tonight. Yeah, Vegas sorry. and Vancouver. Right. Um, well, they're not – I mean, both of them are aggressive. They, they still want to pull something off. I think, as I mentioned, with, with respect to Gensel, I think Vegas is still there. I think Vegas, uh, Vancouver is taking a slot back. Um, but they're looking. They're looking to see. They want to add another piece to their lineup up front. Both of these clubs do. Um, so if if Vancouver can, if they they shift to a Tyler Toffoli or they go after somebody with term, like a Frank Vetrano down in Anaheim, um, or, I mean, I, I don't think Bushnevich either. I don't think that's, that's likely. But, um, and they've got some cap restraints as well. So there's going to have to be a little bit of juggling there. Um, but they want to both add. They want to both add up front, and they want to send a message to their team that, look, we believe in what you're doing. We're buying in. I think Jimmy Rutherford spoke today about Elias Lindholm and his performance and, and giving him a little bit of leeway, saying, look, we're, we're bouncing you here, there, and everywhere in this lineup trying to make you fit. Um, it takes some time sometimes, so we're not discouraged by the play. It's a nice boost of confidence for a guy who has struggled uh, since joining that club. But I think they want to add another offensive weapon so that it's not all up front. It's not all on that first unit come playoff time. Because if this team struggles, they're going to go back to Elias Pettersson, JT Miller, and Brock Besser. And if that's the case, you just shut down that unit and it's smoother sailing against the Vancouver Canucks come playoff time. So they'd love to be able to add somebody to add to their top six to bring in with Lindholm. Because uh, if that's the case, Lindholm slots back to center. You have somebody on the wing, and you can put one of either your younger guys um, on the other side, and now you've got two lines that could do a little bit of damage in the playoffs. So if Vancouver could pull that off, uh, I think they'd love to do it. You know, speaking of Lindholm, it was kind of funny. I mean, uh, uh, Weeksy uh, throwing out that potential three-teamer yesterday of, uh, of yeah. DeBrusque, uh, Lindholm being flipped to Boston, Gensel going to Vancouver. Uh, just how, how much has the Pedersen extension maybe change things in Vancouver as it relates to Lindholm. And uh, I mean, is there any realistic chance that he would be flipped? Re realistic. Yeah. So those, those conversations really got going over the weekend. Um, so uh, we're what? So about five, maybe six days ago. Okay. And that's when the idea was brought to Don Sweeney and the Bruins saying, Hey, you tried to get Lindholm before we got him. Would you have interest in getting him now? And that's and then that kind of took on a life of its own. And I asked around about a three-way. I think it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. I think if it does happen, it's two separate deals at least. Like one may be a three-way, but in terms of Lindholm going to Boston, I think that's a separate trade, Vancouver-Boston. And Gensel and, and Vancouver would be a separate deal as well. And maybe there's a third team in each. But it, it's not like a whole everybody's kind of together. It's not a 16. This is they're not going to go the NBA route where sometimes it's like a five team trade, which I don't know. It's yeah, just, the, it's the fun NBA to talk trades about. are absolutely wild. And um, <laughs> obviously, there's a lot more no moves and whatnot here in the National Hockey League than they are yeah. there. Hey, before we go, we've talked a lot about the teams that have made moves. Um, Ottawa got an underwhelming return for Tarasenko, but they were sort of handcuffed because he had the full no move. 
Yeah. Um, there's, the, I would, shall we say, uh, mixed reaction to what Calgary did after unloading all their guys. But I, I wanted to ask you, you were just mentioning that you're hearing some percolation around the San Jose Sharks. Yeah. Talk to us about the sellers in the West. The San Jose Sharks, the Arizona Coyotes, the Anaheim Ducks. Um, how active might those teams be? And for teams like Winnipeg um, or other teams in the mix right now, what sort of players might be on the move if the right price is got by their GMs? Well, San Jose, it's both Anthony Duclair and Alex Marabanov. Um, by all accounts, they're both being traded tomorrow. I think something is is um, a little bit closer on the Duclair front right now. Um, uh, Barabanov, uh, probably more likely to occur tomorrow. Like, and, and at this time, I mean, there's the sun's out. Like, there's a lot could change, right? Yeah. Um, but that's that's kind of the narrative right now, um, according to uh, a guy that I'm talking to from from the Sharks. So um, we'll see. But those two are expected to move, and then you have other pieces as well. You've got guys like Mike Hoffman and Kevin LeBanc. There hasn't been a lot of interest in both of them because they have high cap hits. Um, but they're available. You have Mario Ferrero on the back end on defense. He's available. Um, and he's got two more years on his contract. Luke Coonan, um, or Cunnan is an RFA. He's a big physical presence. He can, com- he can keep up. He doesn't have, you know, the hands as, as, a, you know, a first or second line player, but he can keep up if he's put into a four, a second line role, more likely acclimated to a third line. The Oilers tried to get him. They weren't able to pull that off. Toronto would love to get their hands on him. I think a team like Winnipeg, I mean, I think he would fit quite nicely with with what they would have on a third line. Again, physicality and can keep up with the pace of play from an offensive side of things. So San Jose's got a bunch of moving parts here. The other thing, um, you know, Anaheim we mentioned Vetrano. He's got a cap hit under under four million with another year on his contract. There's a lot of interest there. They don't have a ton of other pieces on expiring deals, but they're willing to listen and get creative if, if you know, that that's the case. And the same with Arizona. Outside of Matt Dumba, most of their other guys are, you know, Nick Bugstad, another year on his contract. Alex Kerfoot, another year on his contract. Lawson Krause has, I think, four or five years left on his contract. What about Zucker? Uh, Jason Zucker. Well, there's a high asking price for Jason Zucker. Like, Arizona's gone out and said, we want a second-round pick for this guy. We'll retain half his salary. But we want the discussions to start with the second round pick. Um, Vancouver, I think, has put that on the table. Hasn't got there yet. So maybe there's some hesitancy on on their side. Maybe it's, uh, I love this time of year. It's an offer, but it's not an offer. Well, we didn't officially offer that, but we talked about it. Oh, okay, sure. Um, Anyway, so Vancouver is in there um, because they're looking at their options. But other teams, other teams are too. So like Zucker is going to get moved. Dumba is going to get moved. And then it's those other pieces that have extra term on the on their contract. So we'll kind of see how, I guess that like in the East it's Buffalo. Buffalo has a ton of pieces that are still open for they're, they're still open for business. They kept Eric Johnson out of the lineup last night. They didn't say it was trade related reasons, but he was healthy. They implied it. Um, and then you have you know Gergensons and Olafson and Okposo on expiring deals. All of those guys can move, and you have a few other pieces as well with some extra terms. So the bottom feeders in both, there's, there's a lot of availability there from, from some of these clubs. Um, and thank, thankfully, because with, with, what are we at? Five trades today, six, maybe there were six yesterday. We're, we're, we're around a dozen. We need more activity to talk about tomorrow on deadline day. So I'm glad that so many of these teams have so many assets in play. No doubt about it. Just quickly on Dumba. I mean, what, what, what yeah. do they realistically get for Dumba in a move? I mean, I know they wanted a first rounder. Everyone wants a first rounder for their players, whether they get yeah. it or not. It's another story. I'd like a six pack. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I like my beer. So, um, like, that's, uh, yeah. So they asked for a first. And that was when, that was before Tanev was moved. And, and I think some teams thought they'd be able to get a first for Tanev. Walker got a first, but it's not till next year. Um, I think best and they took case Johansson. Is, and, right. And they took Johansson to pay the money because he's, he's been sent to the AHL. Uh, which was interesting. I mean, him yeah. and Torts, they hate each other. Like that's <laughs> that's a light way of putting it. Um, so I was surprised when I heard that. Then I then I was told he's going on waivers. I'm like, okay, that makes more sense. Um, so just a finance play. But they got a first. Arizona, I think best case scenario is a late second round pick. Um, I think more realistic is a third. Maybe there's a late pick attached to it. Um, but I think maybe a third round pick 
and let's say a fifth. You know, similar, you know what, similar to Joel Edmondson and what he what he got from Toronto, a third this year and a fifth round pick next year. Maybe a third and a fifth this year or however they want to offset it. But that's I think the 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 Edmondson deal is a very good comparable to what Dumba could potentially get, even though totally different kind of players. Um, but if Arizona can squeeze another second round pick, because they've got already three this year, four next year, three the year after, if they can get another one, even a late one, I think they'd they'd probably do it. Dave, uh, great stuff. Thanks so much for the time. It's always great talking to insiders on days like this where you have to like be going up and down from your phone the it's... entire time with everything going on. And <laughs> hey, that's what makes it fun. Um, listen, other than refreshing your Twitter feed at the fourth period, fill yes. people in on uh, what you and the fellas have going on at the site and uh, full coverage of uh, everything you guys are doing heading into the deadline. Yeah, we're going to be continuing. We're, we're actually updating or providing a fresher um, list of our trade watch list later on in about an hour or so, maybe a little bit less. We'll be unveiling that um, because so many guys have come off the list. So we'll provide a fresh list on the site uh, tomorrow on deadline day. I'm double dutying between fourth period and NHL network as well. Um, so I'll be on air with them starting at 2 PM Eastern um, in the U S if you get the channel, I'll be there and I'll be on of course, Twitter and everything. Dennis Bernstein as well. Anthony DeMarco, um, also, we'll be providing some reaction as deals happen. Uh, we're going to be providing some some uh, video coverage and some analysis as well. Aaron Ward will be joining us too for uh, for that. So we're trying to provide as much as we can and keeping keeping these things as charged as humanly possible. Yeah, yeah. Just keep it on the charger. That's it. I saw, I saw the yeah. cord in there later yeah. on. Yeah. That's a veteran. That's a veteran yeah. around this time of year. <laughs> hey, dude, thanks a lot. Say hi to Dennis for us, and um, we'll be paying attention to everything you guys have cooking as the NHL GMs get closer to tomorrow's NHL trade deadline. Thanks a lot for doing this. You got it. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. There's Dave Pagnotta. Great conversation, and uh, lots going on around the league right now, so... Uh, should give us lots to talk about tomorrow on our extended WST anniversary slash trade deadline edition starting at 11 a.m. Um, we've got, wow, over 700 people. Great to see you. If you're, if you're new around here, folks, uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button and plan to join us for the festivities tomorrow. Normally, we're live every day, Monday to Friday at 1 o'clock Central. We're going to get going at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and just uh, have some fun, take us all through the deadline. And afterwards, uh, Billick and Mike and Jeff and more of the fellows will be joining us down from Canada Life Center, where Kevin Sheveldayoff and his team will be uh, putting the final touches on the roster heading into tomorrow's deadline. But um, we're going to do our uh, It Takes a, a Community to Play segment in just a minute with uh, John Waldman, who was the great host of ours down at the Hall of Fame. But... Um, Reem, I want to bring you back in for a minute because uh, I saw you fire up on the uh, on the chat while we were talking to Dave. Uh, a little bit more news from Ken coming out of Seattle as it pertains to, uh, well, tomorrow's game against the Kraken and uh, potentially the weekend. Yeah, big news from Ken who's in Seattle. He will be joining us on the show tomorrow, uh, maybe even twice uh, Ken tomorrow, depending on what happens with the Jets and what happens with his schedule. But it is on the ticker at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Rick Bonus has addressed the media, and he has said, one, Connor Hellebuck is one of the players that is under the weather, so that could impact the weekend goalie plan. But more importantly, or not more important, but just also, also I'll say, Gabe Velarde upper body will not play this weekend. So there it is. I, re I really do wonder what that news about Filardi might do to the aggressiveness of Shevel mm -hmm. Dayoff. I mean, I think that if there's any chance that Velarde is going to be dealing with something that's out long-term or, God forbid, not available for the playoffs, they absolutely, I think, need to um, maybe add more than they would have if they knew they had a healthy Velarde there. I'm not suggesting that he is. I just know that this is a guy that has had injury problems in the past, that has been involved with his back, Rick was quite cryptic last weekend when he missed the first game. We're now looking towards a week. It, it will allow them to put him on IR uh, retroactive to when he first was uh, out of the lineup, which allows for a roster spot. Um, but that's uh, that's all a big part of what uh, we're going to be uh, talking about tomorrow as we get closer to it. Uh, because as we know, they put a lot of stock into Gabe Velarde. He's been an incredible part of the uh, top six, as well as the power play ream. 
I mean, if there's any chance that mm, it's a long-term injury or something that might impact the playoffs for Gabe Velarde, I think that significantly changes what they're comfortable for doing or not doing. Yeah, and I'm already seeing it in chat. Oh, just put him on. It's great timing, Hus. Before the trade deadline, put him on LTIR. Bring him back for game one. Just trade for some big the salary. Jets aren't in LTIR. The Jets aren't in LTIR. There you go. The Jets there you have go, Hus. Done $5 deal. $5 million dollars of cap Done. space. Done deal. Get get more cap space, right? Isn't that how, how, <laughs> isn't that how it works? No, that's not how it works. And then he's no, fine so I, for I, game I, one, and they've added every <laughs> everyone. Isn't that isn't that the plan? So well, I guess we'll that's we'll see not what how it works. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. And I do, I yeah, I I agree. I wonder if it would impact the plan if he's going to be out long term. At least it's happening now and not I don't know Saturday or Sunday, and and you can know and try to make some additions. So there are some forwards, some wingers out there that can help. We've talked about them all show, uh, you know, pending UFAs, Vichnevich, although he's not a UFA, but other ones, uh, Riley Smith, Toffoli, Everly, uh, Vitrano, uh, Anthony Duclair who uh, Dave just mentioned, San Jose could be making some trades. So I'm curious if the Jets are going to address that, and maybe by the magnitude of the move tomorrow, we'll have a better idea on the future of uh, Gabriel Velarde. Yes, indeed. Well, um, you know, before the end of the program, we get the audio for Bones. We will uh, attempt to play it. Not sure whether that will be there from uh, from Seattle coming up. But in just a minute, we are going to bring in uh, John Waldman down from the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame for a quick chat. Um, before the end of the program. Very busy night in the National Hockey League with some pretty interesting matchups. We will hit on that. And uh, if we're able to have Rick Bonus join us. But uh, listen, before we head downtown to the Sport Manitoba building, let's uh, continue to uh, take a quick time out to thank the great sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk. The season ticket drive is on right now. I've had great response from a number of people involved in the Winnipeg Sports Talk circle that have already done it. And of course, Book their seats for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Go to winnipegjets.com slash deposit. If you deposit on a package for next season, you can get priority a priority access to playoff tickets, much like myself and other season ticket holders have. Cannot wait for the spring. And but for the spring, we got to get to the uh got to get to the weekend and through the uh the trade deadline. Of course, we're uh, not too far off between uh, talking lots of bombers. Uh, and of course, Princess Auto cannot wait to welcome Blue Bomber fans to Princess Auto Stadium coming up this year when the Bombers get at it. Princess Auto is also a huge supporter of curling in the province. I mean, they've been behind Team Jennifer Jones, and now uh, we're all pulling for our Manitoba teams, including Princess Auto's Reed Carruthers, who's 4-1 and one right now. Um, right now, they're tied for second, I guess, technically, with the Botcher Rink in their pool. Northern Ontario, who Manitoba beat, is a, is one game or half game up, if you will, to use a baseball style of term, five and one right now. Uh, Maddie Dunstone representing Manitoba, three and two right now after uh, his loss last night to Brendan Botcher. Of course, Princess Auto is uh, not only a great sponsor of our teams and uh, our curlers, but Winnipeg Sports Talk, but also the place where you'll find the uh, best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them in-store, Panit Road, Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Thinking about the playoffs I know there'll be a lot of Winnipeg Jet fans and WST listeners wanting to uh, maybe get some new gear for the whiteout. You know where to do that. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway, Winnipeg's true sports superstore for over 40 years, family owned in the peg uh, with thousands of pieces of Winnipeg Jets merchandise, all the jerseys uh, with your favorite players, name numbers done however you want them. Not to mention, uh, you know, hats, hoodies, Q-zips. They've got it all. Great bomber section, NFL, Major League Baseball. And, of course, for people that are playing the game, the biggest and best hockey section in town. Not to mention snowboards for spring break and all that cool stuff on the Kings skate, snow, and surf side. Pop by and see them. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And make sure to follow them on Instagram, at Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And, uh, Couple days with no Jets, but then we go Friday, Saturday night, late night, 9.30 starts. Can't think 
of a better time to get together with the gang at your local Boston Pizza to watch the game with sound on the big screen and enjoy some weekend ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, and gourmet pizzas. And heck, any day, seven days a week, if you want to get it hot and fresh to your door, you can order online at bostonpizza.com. It is now time for another It Takes a Community to Play segment for our friends at Sport Manitoba, brought to you in part by Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. And familiar face to many WST viewers and listeners joins us now, John Waldman from the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame. John, what's going on? How are you? It's uh, another crazy day as we approach that uh, trade deadline. And, of course, coming off the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival, uh, which included the spectacular event that we had uh, with yourself and uh, Michael over at the Hall of Fame. Um, Just a busy time to be a sports fan and to be a uh, a sports personality in this city. Well, there's lots going on. And and you listen, a special thanks to you and the uh, hospitality of the Sports Hall of Fame. Obviously, uh, you know, James and the uh, the Gang of Canadian Club, that was we got just amazing feedback on that event, and uh, we'll look forward to doing something very similar, maybe even bigger next year. And honestly, speaking of the Sports Hall of Fame, what a great venue for events that are tied into sport in our province. I mean, we were there for a whiskey tasting event and a uh, and a jet game, um, but I imagine that that is something that is growing as more and more people see the space. Um, it is more than just a spot to pop in for uh, 20 minutes or half an hour and see the incredible rich history of sport in our province. Absolutely. And we are really uh, opening our doors to uh, all sorts of events. We've had uh, AGMs. We've had winter parties. Uh, you name it. We uh, we can accommodate a, a just about any event that you guys would, that anybody would like. Um, there's lots of opportunities and certainly uh, we can talk later about uh, the best way to get in touch with me, but uh, we are always looking forward to new opportunities to showcase our venue and showcase the artifacts that we've collected over the years. There's a, there's a lot up on the Yithport Manitoba website, as you can see, if you're watching with us on YouTube right now. Um, but we move towards the class of 2024. The event usually happens in November. I believe it's early November, November 7th. But before we find out who will be the honored inductees. Uh, we've got to get some nominations, John. Um, tell us about the class of 2024 and the categories of people, athletes, and builders and more that will be uh, will be honored. Absolutely. So we will are, are opening our uh, nominations now. Um, it'll be open until April 15th. Uh, we're looking for athletes, for builders, and those can be uh, coaches, officials, uh, individuals who ran or supported um, the various sport organizations uh, that are part of the Manitoba landscape uh, throughout the years, um, as well as teams. And those can be anybody from a professional team, such as the Bombers or the Jets, uh, to club teams that excelled on the provincial and national stage. Uh, really what this is, though, is that this is an opportunity to talk uh, to talk up and to celebrate the athletic achievements uh, of very deserving individuals across all sports. Um, you know, we have such incredible rich history, sporting history here in the province, and um, you can really get like a you might need to budget a few extra minutes when you get into the Sports Hall of Fame because there is so much cool stuff of, and stories of people that, you know, especially if you're younger, you may have heard some of these names, but you don't really, um, many people don't really understand or haven't been told about the achievements um, and often what athletes as well as builders went through to have such incredible contributions to their respective sports here in the province. Absolutely. And Yes, last year was my first year um, in the position that I'm at with the Hall of Fame and my first opportunity to uh, meet, obviously, the new class in 2023, uh, but to hear some of the past stories and to learn uh, about some of the names that uh, that have come through the Hall. Um, I look at individuals that we nominate, that we inducted last year, obviously, Milt Siegel, um, but names also that you may not have heard of at first, uh, like uh, Brent Bottomley and Chris Glowak, uh, names that had severe impacts in their sports uh, that have done so much across the board and 
when you see the people that come to the event um, that we're holding November for the induction and you see the emotion on their faces and you and you get to talk with them and learn about these intricate stories of what the what's this individual meant to them it blows you away and there's no other way to put it it's it's really fascinating and it's a really emotional strong night you know he uh, you mentioned chris glock we had him on in our sport manitoba segment on a few weeks ago and uh suzanne who would come on i mean there are it, it is amazing how many hall of famers are still making massive impacts after their athletic career um, in different roles in their respective sports. But as it pertains to the Hall of Fame, John, if you could talk about the significance of recognizing Manitobans who have made such incredible impact in their respective sports and communities. I think it's important, and it's something that we we kind of overlook at times, and it's, it's human nature. Um, we think that, okay, you know, this person has been inducted into the – Hockey Hall of Famer, they've been inducted into the CFL Hall of Fame. What is that going to mean for them to be inducted into the Manitoba Sport Hall of Fame? In actuality, it means a lot because it means that they are still being recognized in the this place where they uh, applied their trade or where they trained or where they came from. Um, Milt for it was a perfect example of that. Um, he's been inducted into so many hall, halls of fame um, that I think that he's lost count of them. But he reflected to us afterward that it meant a lot and that the ceremony meant a lot to him to be recognized. Um, you look then at some of the other uh, sports uh, with individuals that are recognized. Um, it's very easy in Manitoba to get lost in focus on football, hockey, and curling. But there are so many sports that are that don't get the recognition, quite frankly, uh, that I think that we that we can all say that they deserve. So when you look at somebody that comes in, like a Brent Bottomley, who was a pioneer and did so much for building the cross-country skiing community, um, it means the world to his family. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, before induction, but it meant so much to his wife and it meant so much to his kids and it meant so much to his community um, to be, to become part of that. And that's one of the things that we really like to do is we don't uh, just want to stick to our big three or big four sports. We want to make sure that we are properly representing all of our uh, sporting partners, that all of the sports that have uh, a presence in Manitoba are being properly represented. And along with that, that all of our communities are properly represented, whether you are from a BIPOC community, um, whether you are from a from other areas, we want to make sure that we are getting uh, proper representation and that all these stories that we have collected over the years are continuing to be collected and being told in a proper fashion. You know, you mentioned uh, Brent Bottomley. I mean, it's also, you know, huge for the sport as well to be recognized. I mean, you mentioned how, um, you know, you know, on, on a day-to-day basis, people are focused in on the pro teams. And certainly right now, you know, with the Scotties and the Briar happening, I mean, curling has always been huge and there's a plenty of great curling history there. But there are so many other Manitobans that have made impacts in other sports. And, you know, wh- while we mentioned that as far as, you know, the actual inductions, I mean, you've got incredible athletes and builders Builders is something we talk about on this segment so much because of how incredibly impactful people's contributions to sport is outside of being an athlete. I mean, building facilities, uh, officiating, all of those things that go in. Um, But there's also spots for teams as well. Often we think of the Hall of Fame as individual athletes, um, but there are some incredible teams as well that can be nominated and have been in the past. Absolutely. And I mean, I can speak as a as a U of W, excuse me, U of W alumnus, um, but to see the Lady Westman who um, reached incredible levels uh, in the mid to late 90s and the and battled with the UCLA Bruins for that uh, spot of being the most having the longest winning streak in collegiate sport history in North America. Um, they certainly were worthy of that induction uh, when that took place. Um, and we we really like to continue that tradition. You know, it's not um, always about the pro sport or it's not always about um you know, the the ones that get the most notoriety. There's a lot of teams out there that did a, co- a major accomplishments, be it 
that they reached the nationals or that as a team, they ended up going to the Olympics. Things like that are extremely important for us to remember. And it might have been one person that led the efforts. It might have been one person that was at the forefront of the team. But there's a reason why we have those two categories. And people have been inducted on both sides, both in, as an individual and as a team member. No. And I think it's important that we recognize that 99% of the sports, you know, outside of, you know, a couple of them like tennis and, and golf and other individual sports, it really is a combined effort that makes that, that on field or on ice performance so incredible. No, it is a uh, it is a great point. John Walden's with us from the uh, Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame as part of our Takes a Com Community to Play series with Sport Manitoba. So November will be the big gala and the induction. Nominations are open and give us, you, you mentioned the time frame, nominations open until the middle of April. Um, for people that are listening to this or come across this that realize that, you know, I've always thought that so-and-so, this team, this builder, this athlete should be considered for the Sports Hall of Fame, how does one go about putting forth the nomination process? So the easy, it's as easy as clicking onto sportmanitoba.ca and downloading our nomination form. You can also contact me at the hall uh, through Hall of Fame at sportmanitoba.ca or calling 204-925-5936. And we are here to help. Uh, we want to make sure that when a nomination goes forward to our selection committee, uh, which will meet towards the end of May, early June, that we have all the proper information, that we have a nice, full, rich profile that is being put forward to that committee. Uh, so we're certainly happy to help along the way. But it does start with getting that nomination form from our website. John Waldman's with us. John, great stuff. And hey, just for folks that weren't lucky enough to grab a ticket for our event there recently, Fill people in on uh, what they'll see if they pop by the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame uh, individually with their family, with their kids to show all the great history of sport in our province. Absolutely. So we have uh, two uh, portions to uh, to what is on display at the hall. First of all is our permanent display, uh, which is our decades gallery. Um, it's literally a walkthrough uh, from the late 1800s through to today of artifacts, stories, memorabilia of that's commemorate uh, everything in sport. You'll get to see some rare items like one of Billy Mozienko's game used jerseys, um, Olympic medals, Olympic torches, um, a variety of artifacts that you may not even heard of, you may not have known exist. Uh, and you'll see those uh, very vibrantly throughout the hall. Uh, the other p part of the puzzle is we have uh, rotating displays. Uh, currently, we are working with a variety of halls of fame uh, from across the sport landscape. Uh, on some displays uh, that uh, that feature items and the personalities from their uh, honored areas. Um, and that will be on until uh, mid-April. At that point, we're going to be flipping over and we're going to be taking a look at the high school origins of our honorees. So we're going to be having displays from the lakes of SJR, from Balmoral, from Oak Park, and a variety of other high schools. And certainly um, it is an interesting uh prospect that we have uh, endeavored to do here. Uh, we've had some great stories come about. We've had some unexpected stories. Uh, so we're looking forward to sharing those both uh, in person at the hall as well as online. John, thanks so much for coming by. Uh, as I mentioned, we had such a great time and uh, it was so cool to see everything that's on display right now. I highly recommend sports fans make a point of getting down to the Hall of Fame at some point in the future. And in the meantime, go to Sport Manitoba website, Hall of Fame, find out more about the nomination process for the class of 2024, which will go in in early November. Have a great one, John. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. There's another edition of It Takes a Community to Play with Sport Manitoba, brought to you by our friends at Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. All right. Thanks again to John for jumping on. Of course, Sport Manitoba and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. Uh, all right. Uh, busy night tonight in the National Hockey League. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, Remo, let's get you, you back in here. Um, and this actually, I know we're going to be really focusing on the deadline. Tomorrow, that will be the main focus. But we appreciate everyone with the happy anniversaries. We'll kind of do that officially tomorrow, March 8th. Can't believe it. Three years since we did our first show. However... Why not question of the day for not Autocorp, but Waverly and McGilvery? It's to everybody in chat and to you, Michael Remus. 
Are you in or out on Jake Paul fighting Mike Tyson at Cowboys Stadium in July? In. Very in. <laughs> Cannot. Can't wait, Hustler. For this. We, every summer, you know, there's only baseball going on. CFL happens too, but not a lot of major sports. So you need a gimmick fight in the summer. We've seen, you know, Pacquiao, Mayweather. That was a big one. And. You know, Mayweather has done his fights that are terrible where he collects $100 million. This is another one of those. We need it. I'm already getting plans to go out to the beach Saturday streaming on Netflix. Uh, Tyson, Jake Paul. I can't stand that guy, Jake Paul, and I don't know what's going to happen. He's probably not going to lose to 57-year-old Mike Tyson. But I need, yes, I want to see this. I'm in. This is the dumbest thing ever. Sign me up. I thought this was a joke when I saw it, uh, when I saw this today. It apparently is not. And yes, they're going to Cowboys Stadium. I mean, this is not uh, a, a small venue at all. And listen, Jake Paul, credit to him. They've, he is a huge audience. He's got a lot of fans. But I have to admit, this is incredibly sad. For Iron Mike Tyson, arguably the greatest and most ferocious boxer in the history of the heavyweight division, to be pushing 60 and to be getting into the ring with a YouTube star. Now, to Jake's credit, he has been training boxing for a last number of years. I can't give him too much credit because he hasn't really fought anyone. Um, the, the guy, the experienced pro boxer that he fought in his last fight and cleaned him out in the first round, had had one professional fight in the last six years, and as far as I knew, was a DoorDash driver. But Mike Tyson's of different. And, you know, there were those videos probably in the last year of Tyson sort of training and hitting the bag, and he actually did look pretty ferocious. But, I mean, of all these circus fights, this one might be taking it to a whole new level. Yeah, that's why it's so amazing. It's at Cowboys. Stadium. How ridiculous is that? Like, what are tickets going to be, Hustler, uh, for this fight? And, like, would you even go and sit? It? Like, that seems silly. I'd rather just watch it at home. But Jake Paul, you know, he's done a great job fighting former NBA and NFL players and, you know, retired UFC fighters in the boxing ring. But people seem to get interest. And, you know, this almost... Reminds me of when Mike Tyson joined Degeneration X at WrestleMania because, you know, so many, it's WrestleMania this month. So, so many WrestleMania memories are coming up on my timeline. But except for the, except, you know, it's 20, you know, 25 years later and he's 57 years old. There is a video of him practicing in the ring. I, I don't know. The guy hasn't fought a competitive fight in 20 years, Hassan. He hasn't won in more than that. So, like, this is really silly. I'm I'm here for it. I don't know. It is wild. I'm just looking at the chat. Hey, Juliana Clink. Juliana, thank you very much. Hey, she said, wow, thank you for this show. Keeping all of us Jet fans from far and wide up to date on our Winnipeg Jets. Big thank you from Michigan. Appreciate that. Travis. <laughs> Travis is a great one. It will be rigged a la WWE, but here for it, LOL. Um, and I did like the one from, was it from Seeds? Yeah, Seeds of Wonder. I want Paul versus Rempy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So we'll see. There's I'm your... excited. I'm excited, man. I got in a text group. We're already planning the what we're gonna eat. Like we're that's that's bullshit. Come on, that's not true. That's <laughs> certainly not true. Everyone, there might be. It, it, I'm sure it's getting mentioned in a lot of text groups, but. Uh, Anyways, especially yeah. the fact that it's not a pay-per-view. This will get a gajillion eyeballs on it. So uh, this is this is literally the great white hype movie. <laughs> Such a joke, um, and a whole bunch, uh, a whole bunch more. Look at this poster. Tyson a couple of years ago. Yeah, oh, the the poster is good. Sick that was poster. Tyson in '96. <laughs> yeah, you don't think that there's also a, a okay, there's two videos going around of Mike Tyson on social media. One of him boxing in a ring, uh, RG3 tweeted it out. And there's another one of him struggling to walk with a cane. So I'm not sure which one 
to believe which Mike Tyson ring at 57 years old, fighting Jake Paul. Uh, can I use fighting or do I have to use air quotes for that? This is, I don't know. I'm excited. Paul versus Tyson, July 20, Netflix. This is going to be great. There's going to be nothing to talk about, and we're going to be, I'm going to be all over it. We should maybe. Full week. Fu full week of Jake Paul, Mike yeah. Tyson hype before their big fight on Netflix at uh, AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Hey, um, before we get to the games tonight, um, yesterday, I'm sure you saw, and a lot of people in the chat, a lot of people cracking the brand new Upper Deck Series 2 to try to get their hands on the Connor Bedard Young Guns rookie card. Mm -hmm. We have to give a shout out to uh, our pal Dan Asham, the Earl of Eli, Dan, who Dan dropped Milburn. some pretty big coin. Yeah, Dan Milborn, yeah, who uh, dropped some pretty big coin on a case. And he got couple of bedard regular young guns and got one of these exclusives which i think are numbered to i can't tell from the picture is that number to a thousand or 100 this is what yeah this is his boxes this is what he he hauled in yesterday and where's his bedard look at this one there it is is that the exclusive? No, that's not the exclusive. Go to the next one, because the next one is the same thing, but it's a numbered. I think that says 352 out of, I would assume that's 1,000, but... Looks like 100. I mean, if it's a number to 100, Bedard Rookie Young Gun, that would be wild. Um, and, you know, you sent me a message that Carlo Koliakovo was cracking some packs last night on an Instagram Live and I don't know how many boxes or whatever they were getting into, but they very early on, like in the third pack, he got a clear-cut Bedard, not the Young Guns card. And I'm sure there's probably a couple special Bedards that they put in. No idea what the value on that one is. And then very shortly afterwards, got one as well. So um, it, it wasn't all everyone getting them. Dusty got a case. They did six last night in the crack pack and did not get any. Bedard oh, Young Guns wow. in six boxes. So they've got another break going up, and they would assume they'll get one for sure, but who knows. Uh, and what's interesting about this is because Upper Deck, for the first time, has a variation of these cards called the Gold Burst, which is a one of one. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave and Adam's card, they're a breaker. I don't know. I see them online. They have a $1 million bounty for that card. So, Remo, we do have a box. WST has, has stepped up and bought yeah. a box. And tomorrow, during the show, when we're waiting for some trades to happen, if it gets a little, uh, if it gets a little light, we will be cracking these packs. It's a little different, too. The packs are bigger this year, I think, and there's less of them. Does it say on the, does it yeah. say on the box how many are there and okay, how many cards? It says 12 cards per pack and 12 packs per box. So I'll get the card, cam you know, we're not going to be any trades. We're going to have stuff, need to like, do stuff to <laughs> fill the time. So I was like, look, everyone's hyped about the Bedard thing. Let's get a box for WST. It's our birth. It's a birthday present as it well. It's a birthday present to us. It's a birthday present, so we'll open it and we'll try to get that one of one, and maybe we can get some other. There's a Leo. You know, if you don't get Bedard, there's a Leo Carlson rookie. Absolutely, Leo Carlson. Bobby in there. McMahon. Are you in a Bobby McMahon? Uh, <laughs> Twenty-seven hey, year old rookies. Are you into into him? There's no Jet rookies. I looked. No. No, I don't think so. It's been uh, it's been lean for uh, for rookies for the Jets for the last couple seasons, to be mm -hmm. honest. Uh, but can you imagine if we hit the the one of one Bedard while live oh. on our anniversary trade deadline stream? Yeah, I don't even care about the the money. I care about the uh, getting the likes on the video of us hitting the one of one. <laughs> that's what I care more about. Well, anyways, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be fun tomorrow. So uh, we'll kind of splice in some packs we'll throughout the day, yeah, depending we'll on how busy things get. One way or the other, we'll do marbles tomorrow, and we're gonna break these twelve packs mm -hmm. from this box that we bought. Our great investment of the uh, the upper deck series two. Uh, let's get to the cool bet lines, though. A busy, busy night in the NHL. 
Uh, Bruins beat the Leafs in Toronto earlier this week. They're bat at, back at it in Boston tonight. Bruins minus 147 faves. Uh, Leafs plus 125 all over at coolbet.com. Uh, the Quiet Hurricanes minus 321 faves against the Habs, who are plus 260. Oilers, um, Adam Henrique is going to make his debut. Minus 278 favorites in Columbus to take on the Blue Jackets. Uh, Panthers minus 240 faves at home against the Flyers, who are at 2-1. The Blues plus 150. Devils minus 178 in Jersey. Uh, Caps and Penguins, hard to believe both of those teams. Ovi, Sid, Sellers, not going to be in the playoffs, it doesn't look like. Pittsburgh minus 173, Capitals plus 146. Uh, the Flames are taking on the Lightning in Tampa, or what's left of the Flames. Tampa's minus 159, Calgary plus 135. <clears throat> uh, Buffalo plus 148, the Preds minus 175. Nashville making a couple moves today. They got uh, Beauvillier from the Blackhawks, which was an interesting pickup. Uh, the Wild... Minus 138 favorites on the road in Arizona against the Coyotes, who are plus 117. Uh, the Canucks, slight underdog, basically even money. Minus 101 in Vegas to take on the Golden Knights. Minus 116. I do like Vancouver in that game. Uh, L.A., minus 195 favorites at home against the Sens, who lost last night to the Ducks. What a miserable season for Ottawa. Plus 164 for the Sens. And the Islanders and Sharks go at it. Uh, San Jose plus 235. Islanders minus 286. As far as the exclusives go, we got a bunch tonight. Uh, the Lock Shop Partner Parlay is as follows. Uh, Lightning to beat Calgary. Canucks to beat Vegas. Boston to beat the Leafs. Got a nice boost. That one's at plus 525. Uh, Dusty has one as well. Predators to win in regulation. Panthers puck line, so to win by two. And the Kings to win. That's six to one. And then the fellas in the nasty chat cooked one up as well. Cole Caulfield, three shots or more. Nikita Kucherov, two points. And Philip Forsberg, one or more points, uh, plus 350 as well. There's also an Edmonton Sports Talk parlay if you're going to be watching this Oiler game. McDavid, two or more assists. Adam Henrique, a point in his debut. Oilers to win in regulation, plus 550. So uh, that's all over there. And, hey, I know we mentioned this when we were talking Princess Auto earlier, but uh, big win this morning for Reed Carruthers, who uh, goes to 6-1. and one. Cashes are over at plus 130 uh, for over five and a half wins in the pool. Um, he has a big one tonight. It is a battle for first place. That one certainly, I would imagine, will be the uh, feature matchup on TSN. Botcher versus Carruthers, both at 6-1. and one. Whoever wins will get the number one seed coming out of the first round. Uh, both teams guaranteed of moving on to the playoffs. And a big win for Matt Dunstone earlier today. Uh, Dunstone is taking on Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, Northern Ontario, uh, Banat taking on the Yukon. And the standings right now, as I pull them up for our Manitoba teams. Um, now they have Manitoba listed below Northern Ontario. But now that there are no more tiebreakers, uh, I believe Dunstone beat Northern Ontario, which would mean that they are, yeah, they won as well. Yeah, they won earlier today. So I think that puts them in to the playoffs with a win today. So uh, nice to see both Manitoba rinks potentially moving on. Well, one for sure, the other one with a win uh, with a win tonight. And um, we'll probably get to some, uh, some curling picks as well. Just as far as those odds for tonight's game, I know Botcher's going to be a favorite. Let's see what we got at Carruthers plus 205 against Botcher and Botcher minus 286. So if you're going to be watching and want to throw a little bit on the Manitobans, plus 205 is the uh, the bit. And uh, Dunstone, for that matter, a huge minus 2,500 favorite uh, against Newfoundland. So it uh, should be uh, should be moving on. Uh, but, yeah, we got some curling and a ton of hockey tonight, Reem. And then tomorrow, double uh, extended anniversary show beginning around 11 a.m. Set your notifications, folks, so you know that we're live. And uh, beyond that, we'll uh, take it right through the deadline and beyond. 
Hopefully you're from Kevin Shovel Day Off at some point, depending on what time he speaks. We will do marbles. We'll crack a box of upper decks. And most importantly, we'll find out who will be joining the Winnipeg Jets before the trade deadline. Yeah, we'll see who it is. I'm very pumped. Maybe even, Huss, if there's really no trades, we'll bring out the power wash simulator. <laughs> we can just have a casual conversation while power washing. Uh, well, simulated power washing the backyard or whatever, whatever's in there. So uh, I'm excited for tomorrow, you know, four-hour show. We've hit a lot of milestones. About to hit uh, 3 million views on YouTube as well. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Ken's going to join us in the morning before the Jets practice and maybe even after as well. Brandon confirmed and all the guys at the at the rink there. Uh, exciting. Beautiful. Hey, shout out to Yuch, uh, who's a regular lock shopper as well and an EST guy. Uh, the Nasty Chat Parlay came out of the EST Discord right on. We'll put a little sprinkle on that. I'm going to jump on the Partner Parlay. I don't mind Dusty's actually ride with Dusty as well. Uh, but lots of options if you want to get to CoolBet. By the way, use the promo code WST if you haven't played a CoolBet before uh, for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. Uh, all right. I'm going to try and crush a ton of chewable vitamin Cs, get some sleep, and get ready to fire it up tomorrow at 11 a.m. Of course, uh, stay on top of the Winnipeg Sports Talk Twitter feed. Uh, for the latest on the Winnipeg Jets, if anything breaks or happens over the course of this evening or early tomorrow morning. Otherwise, we'll be live at 11 a.m. Central for four-plus hours, our third anniversary, coinciding with the NHL trade deadline. Could be one of our biggest shows ever. Make sure you join us then. Thanks again to all of our sponsors that make this show happen every day. John Waldman, Dave Pagnotta, Scott Billick, and make a point to hang with us for trade deadline day tomorrow, following everything around the league, focused on the Winnipeg Jets, tomorrow on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a great night, everybody. Oh, my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com. 